Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we almost have the original crew back here with us right now. We have, uh, I'll start with Amber, Cannondale and Trainer Road's Amber Pierce. Hey, everybody. Good to have you back, Amber. We it's have our, C- yeah, our CEO, Nate Pearson. You can call me Trainer Road's Nate Pearson. <laughs> Trainer Road's <laughs> Nate Pearson. <Thank> you. <laughs> and we have Cliff Barr and Trainer Road's Pete Morris. How's it going, guys? Good to have you, Pete. Uh, this is going to be a fun crew. We're going to discuss the questions that you've submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And if you haven't done that yet, or you haven't done it in a while, submit any questions you have there. We'd love to hear from you. And also you can check out the science of getting faster podcasts and successful athletes podcast links are down in the description below. We have some more content with those podcasts coming up here really soon. It's exciting stuff. So tune into that job postings. We should talk about that first, Nate. Uh, yes. Do you want to take us through that? Yeah. First one, vice president of engineering. I mentioned that on the podcast and I feel so bad because we never actually posted it through a recruiter. We got an ideal candidate. Uh, Amber, <laughs> Amazing. You, like you pumped. Yes. Amber was part of the very, very team. pumped. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm sorry, but we, we went with her and she's really, really good. And, uh, I don't think I can't imagine a better candidate. So, uh, Stephanie, where she's going to join soon. And, uh, yeah. So I'm sorry though, for people, I know people got their resumes ready and to like apply for it. Uh, and yeah, sorry. Second one, we have two other job postings. Um, we have app developers for react, react native TypeScript, MobX, that kind of stack, uh, to build features for trainer road and also uh, software engineers, C sharp backend web Azure to handle the data stuff. Uh, both are very, I don't know, they're cool jobs. You might be under Pete, you might be under Amber, you might be under another product manager. Uh, but it is, we're, we've got a lot of openings, so I think we're hiring total like 15 engineers. So there's room. So please apply. And also, uh, anywhere in the world we're we're opening it up completely. The only thing is that Australia is a little bit hard because of time zone. You have to wake up so early to have overlap, but we do have a lot of East coast, U S, uh, Europe, uh, starting to get some South Africa, that kind of time zone. And there's enough overlap, especially with product managers living in uh, Europe or on the East coast that it, it makes it pretty, pretty easy. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. Please apply at trainer.com slash jobs. Nice. And then also we should give a quick update on adaptive training for anybody listening to this. It's exciting. You can sign up for the closed beta. It's still in closed beta right now. And you can do that at trainerroad.com slash AT. We've added even more people to it. And as we add more people that allows us to find different edge cases or different aspects of this specific feature that we can build out and kind of like build for those unique edge cases that you listen to this right now, you'll probably bring to the table once you start using adaptive training. So it's uh, exciting. It's progressing quickly. Uh, I'm using it right now with uh, the polarized training plans. It's like beta on beta. It's pretty sweet. So, um, but that's a, uh, it's, it's exciting stuff. We have a quick question from Niels on that. And also if you have any questions on adaptive training, just submit them once again at trainerroadcom slash podcast. Before yeah, we go in the question, I want to, more clarity. So we have yeah. 962 people in the beta. Uh, there is, we're doing small releases for, well, we haven't done it yet. Small releases to get more features out to people. And the first release was to get levels out to everybody. So at least you can see the workout levels. Uh, there's one thing that this happens in software. Everything's ready, but one thing, and then one thing takes forever. So we really <laughs> thought we could get it out quickly. Uh, as of today, it's wrapped up and scheduled for Monday launch. That would be today's May 6th that could still with software, something could be caught. Right. Um, but that is, I just want to be open and transparent. That's what it's trying to do. And then the next release, Amber's got that one on lockdown. And I think, uh, it's just testing bugs at the, at the moment, correct Amber for release two. Yep, exactly. Yep. And, uh, we don't need to talk about the exact features in that, but once we release it, you'll see that. So that should probably, hopefully maybe kind of sort of come relatively, uh, soon. After that, is that enough clear? Like, <laughs> fires on Super that? precise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, two, a lot of people in the forum said, hey, but I want to know what's the total amount of people that have signed up for adaptive training and uh, in the beta, in the email list. And uh, we don't share that just because we don't share the same amount of uh, athletes that subscribe to Train Road, because I think it's, a, it's competitive knowledge. So for instance, what if I said 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million? Is each one of those, if I said that's how many people signed up, if you're a competitor for trainer road, you might change your whole business strategy based on just that thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I said 100, you'd be like, well, this is not some, we should not do this. But if I said 1 million, you'd be like, okay, we're developing a team. We're going right now. And we're, <laughs> we're, we're going after this 
uh, with a whole bunch of money. And that's why we do it. I'm not trying to be cagey with the athletes, but I do want to have competitive advantage in the market. And uh, I think we do have a huge competitive advantage with this release, and I want to stay ahead and keep running fat or cycling faster than everyone else, hey. climbing faster. Hey. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. A uh, question from Niels on this. He says, I love the train now feature and can usually get about three workouts in a week, but when to schedule them between work, kids, life, et cetera, gets complicated. I feel you on that. Um, I think we probably, everybody listening to this does. The train now feature takes away the stress of trying to jam a rigid square plan into a round hole, so to speak. I understand that the train now feature uses adaptive training on the back end, or I shouldn't say we shouldn't say that it uses adaptive training as much as it uses aspects that it shares aspects of both of those. Right. So, um, now somebody says, uh, or then Neil says, I have a smart trainer, but no funds allocated for power meters on my outside bikes. I would imagine this circumstance is quite common. The weather is getting nicer and I still do trainer rides, but I mix in more outdoor rides in a previous episode. Nate mentioned adaptive training can use heart rate for outdoor rides without a power meter does train now take this into account or is incorporating heart rate data into adaptive training, a future enhancement. Can you guys expand on how this would affect suggested plans? So lots of questions there, Nate. It's a cool question. So as of now, what we do is, uh, we did an ML project to, so we looked at everyone's riding outside and we looked at their heart rate and their power and, uh, TSS. So what we, we did is we tried to train a model to figure out, okay, based on the heart rate fluctuations, what kind of TSS do people get? So we could, we could go right after, or we could go, we could do that because we know the power. And then now if somebody rides without a power meter, we have, you know, within a certain confidence interval and it's the shorter the ride, the better when you get seven, eight, nine hours, it's a little bit harder, but, uh, two hours is pretty close. Uh, what the TSS is for somebody. And then that then feeds back into our FTP prediction uh, for what somebody could be uh, the predicted FTP in the future. But the, the neat thing is with train now, the, the workouts that come out that get suggested, I think there's been, I don't know, four or five updates, a whole bunch of little small tweaks that almost, that we're not there yet, but the idea is to get the recovery aspect more and more in a train now so that when you open it up, we can recommend, and that's actually in beta right now, you have a recommended, uh, this is a beta for everybody. So if you're on one of the beta apps, you see it, recommend one of those energy systems based on previous work. And that takes some things into account, but not all things. And basically it's like I said a million times, this is a stepped release. So heart rate TSS outside stuff is on that list to make it so that we uh, put more and more information to suggest an even better train now workout. And honestly, in the future, train now will be like a little adaptive training plan. You just don't know. You just pick the days you work out. That's kind of the evolution of it where you just jump on. And if you did a, uh, I think it's already in there now. If you do a hard day, it doesn't suggest another hard day in a row or tries to push you to another in easy beta. day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In beta. Yeah. So that's the, that's the kind of evolution as we get more and more data with everything, those should change. Uh, so, that. so I Nate, hope that basically not yet inside of train now, but yes, we're taking into account. Uh, I want to take a little bit of time to clarify between train now and adaptive training. I've seen particularly like on the forum and then to throw their comments, people asking like what the difference is. And if I could like simplify it and Nate, you might be able to go into more detail on this, but to simplify it, train now picks workouts based on picks, I like appropriate workouts based on what you've done recently. So it doesn't really have like a, a point B that is trying to pull you toward. That point B would be your goal event Correct. or a discipline that you're working for. So it could pick those workouts, but it might not be building you a steady state athlete into the crit racer you need to be for your goal. Correct. Right. So whereas adaptive training takes into account the, the kind of like the glide path and trajectory that you need to take to reach whatever the main goal is. So it does what train now does in terms of finding appropriate workouts for you, but it does so while bringing you up to that glide path for whatever your goal event is. Ooh. We so. need a little blog article and a marketing thing about this because you just explained it great. We're on training it. Plans. It's happening right now. <laughs> Quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, training plans have uh, tapers, recovery weeks, and going towards base build special towards specific goal. Train now is great for general fitness. I want to ride faster with my friends. Um, I, I'm not as uh, structured inside of like what days of the week. There might be things changing all the time, although you can do that with the plan too. But mm -hmm. if you just want to be more fit in general fitness and like not get dropped with your friends, um, train now is great for that too. 
Yeah. And it's good for filling in the gaps too, right? Nate, like you've been filling in the gaps now, not following a plan recently. So then when you do train, you've just been using train now to find the workout, right? That is, yeah, it's super fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second, but just being able to jump on and, and do a ride and not follow the, the plan. I need to actually just delete my plan. Cause I'm, I don't know. My TSS has gone from, I don't know, it's like 84 for a six week TSS. And now I'm at like 12 or 20 or something like that. It's it's uh, hey, it's not nothing. It's, it's, it's <laughs> not nothing. That's, <laughs> That's it. Uh, so can we, uh, a quick little update too, just on the podcast host here, I've been getting messages about like why I'm not allowing Amber to be on the podcast and like, <laughs> <laughs> like, and if we put Chad in a closet and hit him or what we did. So, um, uh, Amber, uh, a quick update from you. How are you doing with, uh, of course you have a very important task going on that isn't for work, work related. <laughs> yeah. I've been busy. Uh, my, my bodybuilding, uh, let's see. Oh, you, you can't see this on the podcast, but oh, we can, can see the baby bump. Yep. I'm just showing my baby bump. I got a good bodybuilding Big. program is going well. <laughs> it's happening. Working hard over here. Um, yeah. So things have been good. Just, just been really busy guys. And so we've had some other guests on and really happy to be back though. It's great to be here. And no, I haven't been locked in a closet for the record. <laughs> <laughs> and Chad's been in the middle of a big move and he has like a lot of just uh, life stress as well going on right now. So we're just um, trying to uh, give Chad all the space that he needs to be able to get what he needs done and to be able to care for those that he has in his life. So, um, so yeah. Chad might be out for a few more weeks. Um, but Chad is very much, uh, he, he wants to come back on the podcast. He keeps messaging on that. He's just not really able to right now. So and this happens with, uh, every, this is going to happen with everyone's life at some time, right? People go through these things. And if you are a, in uh, a manager or a leader of somebody having them back at work or doing stuff while having that hmm. just extends the time. I mean, it's horrible for the person. It's horrible for the company it extends the time that it takes. Uh, people need to be able to go and do their thing, recover, uh, mentally and, you know, take care of their stress before they come back. And I think sometimes people try to come back too early and then mm -hmm. it just, it's no good. It's no good for anybody. And it's, it should be expected, uh, that it's going to happen for everybody sometime in their life at least once, but maybe multiple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it absolutely happens. I'm, I'm grateful to work here for that. Uh, I was Nate, just going to say that's one of the best things about working here is it's incredibly supportive and it's not just a, you know, we really walk the walk on work-life balance. It's not just oh, talk. I, I haven't said this yet. I don't think anyone knows this besides Brandon, but with tiny pulse, so you guys know tiny pulse, we do this mm -hmm. like, but if you have a company, tiny pulse is amazing. It's, it's, uh, what's it called? Uh, anonymous employee feedback. So every two weeks they get a message in Slack and they can send me messages anonymously, but it's like, one is just like, how much do you like to work here? But other stuff's like, do you walk the walk? Do you have all the tools you need? Uh, how, how good is your company at planning or something like that? And then Do you feel like your you company can, lives up to the values that it states that it has. That was in one just yesterday. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and they manage all this and then you can look through and do these things and then make changes and improve the company. Um, but I found out we, this is, I don't know how to say this to the company because if you tell someone they're happy, it's like, why are you telling <laughs> me that? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's yeah, right, always yeah. better. There's always things that you can do to improve. And, uh, uh, there's a, there's always things you can do to prove, right? That constant improvement core value that we have. But for tiny pulls, we, uh, we won the, like the most, the happiest software company that they have, uh, for everyone that's done it. And I don't know if that's their that's end so is cool. like eight or two. Yeah. I know, but it's just weird to be like, you're the happiest when, uh, so Stephanie, our new VPE, her, her job as a servant leader is to make all the engineers happier. And she has all these great ideas and I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, you're right. We could improve all those things. So I feel like we have so much room to go. Um, so you just can't tell everyone, Hey Pete, by the way, did you know you're the happiest person? <laughs> Therefore, I, when you, I think what it is, is when you get that, when you have it, it makes it seem like, well, you can't improve because you're the, the sure. estest. But so that's anyways, if you do, I say this because of the job posting, um, it's definitely a different culture than a lot of companies and it's not f the same culture for everyone, but hopefully you get an idea by listening to a, listening to us that if you do, uh, join us, it's hopefully we try to optimize happiness because it's good for the person, but it's also good for the company. It's, mm -hmm. it's a win-win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, one, uh, Nate, do you want to share It's just a quick update on, on your sure. end too? Are you been out? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've been out, uh, my wife and I, or I guess ex-wife now separated earlier in the year. So I'm going through a divorce and we're just focusing on being good, uh, co-parents at the moment. 
and that's all going well. Interesting fact, I bought Chad's house. So Chad <laughs> moved Because Chad moved, I yep. Yep. He's in Idaho or Washington? I forget Washington. which side, but... Washington. Yeah, Washington. Yep. So his fiance is going through a... Uh, a residency, some really high level vet thing that's specialty. So he's living up there. Doesn't change anything for Trainer Road because uh, as you see, a lot of us are in different places here and we can be remote. Uh, but yep, so going through that and that's just taking a lot of my time because there's so many things to do to move a whole house, set up the kids and all that sort of thing. Um, side note, uh, I start, started seeing a therapist at the beginning and I can't describe how awesome it is to see a therapist. And there's, I know, so it is a luxury, at least in America, because it can be very expensive. And I just want to say that, that it is not something that everyone can do. Maybe your health insurance can do it. And then other countries, I know it's free. Uh, but what, how, in my mind, I thought is only if you're going through something very like traumatic, do you need a therapist or if you have something stuck in your brain. But, uh, there's also this other side that I was not, I had not aware of, but the self-reflection of just getting to know yourself better. And, and talking through things and being like, wow, that's why I do that. That is a super cool thing. And if you can, if you have the means or the availability, I highly recommend it. And there's like a, a stigma around it. That's another reason why I talk about it. Um, but I, you know, I'm like, it's really cool. So I, I'm going to do it as long as I can af afford it, uh, just yeah. to have that self-reflection and try to improve and get to know yourself better. And then as you get to know yourself better, uh, everything's more fun. That's kind of going to be a common theme, actually, for some of the questions that we'll cover uh, today in this in this podcast too. Well, one quick thing that I want to cover, Nate, you you made the one little thing that ended up taking longer about uh, release one, this next release that we're working on, where we can get levels up for everybody. You made it seem yeah. like a small thing, but uh, at the risk of teasing something, I'm just going to say it's a very big thing. Like it will no, have a, a profound <laughs> impact on everybody that uses Trainer Road. So. Uh, it's very exciting too. Um, so we've been working really hard at it and I'm excited to, to see that release. So stay tuned, exciting stuff. Just go to trainerroad.com and be ready for it all. So, um, I raced recently and at the risk of like monologuing here, I don't know, Nate, if you want to ask me some questions about this, but I do have takeaways yeah. that I want to share because I'm fully vaccinated and I was so excited to finally, like my, my mom, she's undergoing some very powerful treatments for, a a, a, a very tough illness that she's going through right now. Um, not cancer, but, but, um, she's going through a really tough time. So as a result, our whole family has been very diligent about the lockdown and we haven't left a bubble and we've been very like, so it was just incredible to go race again and to do that. And it just felt amazing, but I have a lot of takeaways on it. Okay. So, so John, you got last place yeah. in a race, which is, just... <laughs> I did get last place. <laughs> like it's true. Giggles. There were two races. Uh, uh, <laughs> One race you did very well, and the other race it was only like four people, and they were like all national champions. And if yeah. I would have done it, I would have been ten minutes behind, but or maybe more. Uh, yeah. So you went to Utah and you raced a TT and then a uh, XCO, XCO, and mm -hmm. the TT. Tell me about the so who was in it, and then because this is a good to stack up the nationals. Who was in it, and what was the result? Yeah, and this is kind of the point of uh, so if you want to do a national championship race, you have to do the big races before that to get to know who's going to be there. I think that is really important because a results sheet from afar doesn't really tell the story. So that's why I wanted to do this race. And, uh, it was a guy who's like the current, uh, he aged up, but he's the current national champion across like multiple disciplines. We had two X pros. We had another national champion, a guy that named Roger Arnell from Utah. I'd never heard of him. He's won low to jaw. He's like a state champ. He's like really, really good athletes. And I, got fourth out of four in that time trial. And I missed it by one second. Um, I missed third, uh, which is crazy, but top four, I know. Right. But That's some right. things I learned about this, That's it, top four. Yeah. Some things I learned with this, I was so afraid of blowing up. And if you're listening to this and you have like some sort of an event coming up and you haven't raced in a long time, you'll probably have the same fear. Like I was, even though I've done a ton of training, a huge amount of structured training, and I've, I'm really familiar with the sort of power I could put out. I totally second guessed myself. And I went out really easy When I say really easy. I was going out and I was at threshold and like just right around there when really this TT was going to be around 20 minutes and it was a climb up and then a descent down, but the descent down, you had to sprint out of every single corner because it was uphill out of every corner. So really like you never felt like you descended, but still only 20 minutes. I should have gone harder. I didn't go hard as I, or hard as I should have. I bled so much time in the first third of the climb. Second third of the time, I started to slow that a bit. And then at the final third of the climb, I stopped that bleeding and even gained on them. But that was when I was realizing I'm almost at the top. What am I doing? Yeah. So pacing is really hard. And one of the things I was doing is I was looking at power really diligently. 
And I probably shouldn't have because of the fact that it was a relatively short climb. But the main thing with the climb is it was constant switchbacks. And in those constant switchbacks, I put my power to 10 seconds to try to like smooth that out. And I think that that was a mistake too. I should have just gone off of feel and uh, I didn't. But the one thing that I did learn with this is that um, on the descent, it's uh, so I pre rode the course. And when I went through and pre rode this course, I caught myself going through it really rapidly because I forgot how to pre ride a course too, because I don't know how to race bikes anymore, apparently. And I went through it and I had a few close calls on it. And then I got to the bottom and I was like, wow, why, why did I just like ride through that at normal pace? So I went back through and I went through every single turn slowly stopped and looked and analyzed it. Even the turns that seem simple. And I think it really helped because I was able to gain time there on the descent. But Sean, I want to say something you said on blowing up. This is something that I've struggled with too, is that if you never blow up ever, are you really pushing yourself? Do you know your limits? And this is one thing that a power meter to your point can actually be a hindrance. Um, definitely I've blown up in 40 K TTs or long time trials, right? You start yeah. that trial and then you're like, oh my goodness. And it just keeps going down. That is a bad pacing strategy, but something like a, uh, uh, a time trial where it's a mountain bike, like time trial, mm -hmm. you probably don't know your. 20 minute where variable output, like you might know your 20 minute power, but the variable output of a mountain bike race. And then with the descent, um, I think in that case, it's probably good for the first minute. So you're not going out at 500 Watts, but mm -hmm. after that, man, let's go to another page or something and just get that, like that feel of, uh, this is very important in racing, right? That feel, especially if you're in a breakaway or something or you're, or you're soloing that feel where you're right at that top, maybe that at V BT three, you're just there <laughs> or right below it. Uh, so depending on how long it is, that's incredibly important. Amber, did you do that when you were racing pro is have that? Well, of course you did, right? Have that feel of where you could go and you probably developed that really well. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to reiterate what Jonathan said about that fear of, have I forgotten how to do this? I, I swear every single off season, every single year after of my career, I came back and was like, I, I've completely forgotten how to race. And then you do that first race and you're like, oh no, I, I could still do this. <laughs> it's, it's very silly, but it's so, so normal. <laughs> yeah. And so then the whole world is the whole cycling world is experiencing right now is like going back and doing events <laughs> after such a long time off. So Can you're not alone. <laughs> if you're feeling this, everybody else with you is also feeling the same thing. Um, some things that I've learned about also on rebounding, like with the performance, so like I was really like upset with myself. I'm pretty harsh with myself and I was so upset that I underperformed. Right. And mm -hmm. so, but I, I listened to what Russell Finsterwald said on the podcast and he says he gives himself 15 minutes and like those 15 minutes are where he's like really giving like, like, you know, he's being open with himself and giving him the time to express whatever he wants to express to himself. He's analyzing in that 15 minutes. And then after 15 minutes, he wants to have what he's going to do better already laid out. And he's committed to that and he doesn't let it hold him back anymore. And that was like really helpful. I feel like, so I learned a lot of stuff from that. Some stage race stuff. Once again, don't change up what you eat on a stage race. It was so tempting. Um, Sarah was uh, my wife. She was with us and we were with Ryan, uh, Standish from trainer road and also Ivy from trainer road. And, uh, there was delicious food and all this stuff. And I like, I turned it all down and I just stuck to the basic stuff that I knew that my stomach would handle. That's a really important thing with stage racing, because sometimes you can find yourself with a gut that's really messed up because you took in something different. Um, other thing is pay attention to meal timing when you have like races and it's just like day after day that you're racing like that. It's so important to, to not just fill yourself up full of food at times when you don't have races coming up or try to starve yourself for some reason in between and stage races are not the time to lose weight. So pay attention to meal timing. And then also look at the food that you're eating in terms of, and we'll cover this a little bit later. Actually, Pete said this very thing in like the same words uh, for a question, but look at the food that you're eating in terms of like performance enhancing potential. So what I mean by that is like, when there's a lot of food and a lot of things to choose from prior to those races, uh, it's a lot more focused on just carbohydrates and things that I know that I'm going to use. Right. And I really focus in on those foods prior to when I eat, whereas after the race, I'm not going to be quite as, you know, just focused on taking in a bunch of rice, for example. Um, it'll be more variety, more nutrition, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah. And then also do your chores as soon as you can after the race, when you have to wash your bike or do anything like that, just do it right after the race. It's so much worse if you let it like wait. If you oh. sit down, ooh, don't sit down, <laughs> you sit down, it's yeah. over. And then yeah. you have the stress. It's like uh, what Amber talks about. You're not in the parasympathetic state because you're like sitting there and you, you have like cortisol that starts to creep up because you know you have to do something, but 
turning off TikTok and getting up is so hard. <laughs> or like, yes. you know, you post on Instagram, you're like, oh, look at me. Like, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wait until you, just John said, all the way set up. And if you're like all the way set up, it's so nice. Then mm -hmm. when you do sit down, it feels amazing. Yes. Something that mountain bikers oftentimes don't think about too is in feed strategies. You don't have to fill your bottle up all the way and you don't have to cover if you have a feed zone, which this is a UCI race. So it had a double-sided feed zone. You didn't have to carry all of your nutrition for the whole race either. So I used bottles that were only filled about one third. They were small bottles and they were filled about with about a third of that. So that meant that I would drink that entire thing down almost instantly when I would grab it. I'd have a splash left and that would be it for the rest of the lap. And it made it great so that that way I could, I wasn't carrying extra weight. And then I was still able to hit my goal of 110 grams of carbs for the, for the race. So per so, hour, I, more on this, uh, a, bo a small bottle, that's 16 ounces. And how much John, did you weigh? Like how much a specialized bottle? I did. I, th no. I thought it's, it's not light. So yep. well, it's relatively light. Okay. So 16 ounces, that's 450, uh, four grams, like a pound, a pound. You know how much we spend to save a pound? It's like a two thousand dollar thing. And how many times have you finished a race where you like have a full bottle on your yes. bike? Just like, when I did triathlon, I was so scared of running out of stuff. I'd have like I'd have two extra like thirty two ounce bottles on the back. I just carry it the whole time and like twelve extra gels just in case like the feed stations disappeared on the on the race course. Uh, yeah. Like I don't. It's so crazy that we carry this the whole time. And uh, you see people too. Uh, this is another good race strategy big long climb at the end, you know, you're not going to drink that bottle. You see people squeeze it out and it seems kind of mm -hmm. silly, but a pound, like, geez, a pound just <laughs> lost all at once. That's a lot. That's yep. a lot of money. We paid yeah. what, uh, what was Dura Ace oh. over Ultegra? It's oh like my 70 gosh. grams for like a thousand dollars. Yes. Like, right. <laughs> we're buying it's that. Like, we're carrying two bottles at the same time. Yeah. I think people, someone should make a really light bottle. That would be awesome too. Cause that's a, and light uh, kit. That's another thing. No one talks about how much their kit weighs. And I know. it's a, it's like a hundred gram difference between different kits. And I know we're getting very into the weight weenie stuff and it doesn't really matter, but yeah. uh, if I have two <laughs> if kits, you're going to spend money lighter, one spot, why don't you analyze everything? Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. But, in, and if, if you're going to buy a kit, you're gonna wear clothes no matter what, why not wear the lighter clothes if they're still comfortable? Yeah. We hope. Yeah. 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 I was just gonna <laughs> yeah. Say, let's See not through. take this weight concern thing too, too <laughs> far. <laughs> just thongs. <laughs> tank tops. Jammy, just a chamois. That's it. Find a way to put the chamois on. That's it. Um, so the, the one, thing with this too, is that you probably have things on your bike that I did at least like I had that specialized swap box. I had two bottle cages. I have my Garmin. I took that off and I just used my watch. I have like a Garmin forerunner 945. I just ran that. And that was nice too, because in that XCO race, I did not want to look at power like at all. Yeah. I just wanted to go with to. the field, see what was going to happen. And so it was really nice to have the watch and I just have a page set up where it just shows the laps time and that's it. And that's all that I had on that thing. And it makes you never glance at it. It's really, really cool. So, um, uh, let me just say this, Pete in a crit, do you look at power other, maybe if you're off the front, do you look at pa power at all? No, I mean, it, it's only detrimental to me. I think if I'm looking at it, then something else is wrong. Like I should be thinking about something <laughs> else, uh, yeah. or paying attention or something like that. Uh, so nope. Cause you have never. to react too, to the field. Pete's too busy. Yeah. Just dropping a hammer. Like what else? <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's all. Thor's hammer. Thor's hammer. You look uh, at time. I think you and Amber, you both have time up there, right? Cause that's very important mm -hmm. to crit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, one thing I want to talk about with this race, they waived the riders by 30 seconds per age group. So they had cat ones, uh, women and men. And we were like one of the last groups and we were a very fast group. And we had, it was like over a hundred riders on course, uh, because of the, how many people were racing and it was waived every 30 seconds. So that made it so that there were bottlenecks because also another thing in mountain bike racing, everybody starts super hard. And a lot of people are trying to like cash checks that they cannot afford to do. Right. So they're pushing way too hard. And then this course has a couple where you fight, you go into single track after like a start section that's steep and it gives you plenty of time to sink your ship, so to speak. And then it gives you single track. We had entire bottlenecks where it's tape to tape people off their bikes entirely stopped just waiting because somebody either, you know, they got caught up with each other in a single track section. Somebody crashed in the single track section, something like that. And on the first lap there were, it was seven minutes longer than the following or no three minutes longer than the following laps, which is a lot. So these laps are like 14 minutes long. Well, that's um, why people go out hard, right? Because if you don't get caught in that, you just save three minutes. Isn't yes. that crazy? Yeah. And 
try to fight that back later on. It's just too hard to game that three minutes. So, but the hard thing is, is when you have these wave starts, amateur racers, this is common for us. No matter what you do, you can't fight ahead in a group that's, you know, for five minutes, they've been letting people go at 30 second intervals. You can't get through all of them. So a couple things that helped in this scenario is number one, if it's within the tape, it's fair game. So even though the trail may be skinny, if the tape is wider than that, it's fair game. And there was a spot where there's a really skinny single track shoot and there's a ton of sagebrush, but it was all within the tape. And I just like went back to my dirt bike days and went wide open through the sagebrush and hoped and prayed. And it ended up working out, got around a bunch of people, <laughs> but there are a bunch of other spots too, where you'll find yourself, oh, we're stuck and we can't move forward. Just look, oh, lift the vision a little bit there and look at the course and you can probably find ways to get around that said. When it really gets into a bottleneck and you can't get around people, do we have this situation on the course? Don't panic. Yell at There's them. no point. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yell loudly. What are you Be guys very doing? Angry. Get out of my way. I, you know who I am? I, I, people yes. do this to me because I've done that uh -huh. where I got too fast, especially with the steep switchbacks so that I jump off and I am the I am the one. I look back and there is 50 people that's having a car city off road. Yes. They all have to get off their bike. I am so sorry. But yelling actually makes it worse. Uh, yelling yes. gets people like, it does. It, it's like, oh my goodness. And then they start doing things that are weird and it will, will actually make you go slower yelling. And it's not the cool thing to do. Yeah. And you just got to stay calm. And in this case, even though it was effectively stopped, if you stayed on your bike in your lowest gear, you could just kind of pedal around. Walking is harder than just sitting on my bike and pedaling at hardly any wattage. So there's some people who are like, get off your bike, man. What are you doing? But it wasn't harming anything. I was just carrying on with the group and just soft pedaling and it was less energy. So in those situations, once again, and Erica Carney said this in last week's episode, but, and actually said this in a fantastic blog post that Sean wrote, don't listen to advice that's yelled at you in the middle of a race. Chances are it's terrible. So like, um, but just stay calm in those moments whenever there's chaos going on and then just try to pick them off. And also being aggressive is okay. Like, uh, in mountain biking in particular, when you come into a tight turn, that's really slow, that sort of a thing you can bump. That's okay. It's not, it's not like that's illegal. It's not like road racing when you're sprinting in a finish at 40 miles an hour on tarmac with barriers around you. That's a very different scenario than being almost stopped. So be aggressive, look for those lines and, and go into it. Um, two more things that I just want to share really quick. Number one, bill at those reduced amplitude bill at intervals. Those are like where you go up and let's just say you start just below threshold and you do that for 15 seconds. Then for the next 15 seconds, you're up at like 130%. And then you just repeat those 15, 15s, but you don't drop all the way down. You'll do like a set of like five minutes of that. And by the end of it, you've really reached that peak aerobic uptake and you're breathing through a straw and it's really tough. They're so good for cross country racing. And you'll see those in our plans. I've been doing a, a lot of those leading up to this. And also those five minute VO two intervals that are so painful, those long VO twos as uncomfortable as they are, my goodness, they're so great for this, uh, for cross country racing. So it was just nailed home. The final thing is don't let yourself fall in subconsciously to bad body positioning when you're tired. So like in mountain biking in particular, you'll lean really far forward and you'll be rocking and you'll be pulling because it's like over 20%. It doesn't help you. If you just relax and sit up, and try to just put the power through the pedals, it's better in every case. And I had to remind myself of this pretty regularly, but I've been making an effort to do that in training. And I felt like it was a strength when that course, it just gets progressively steeper for five minutes. And then it's really steep and tight at the end. And just telling yourself to stay calm, it really does help. It goes a long way uh, toward helping, but it's a ton of fun. I, I I'm so happy to race again. It was a blast. One of the things, John, I, uh, we were talking about it last week or last week, but you are also a lot stronger of a cyclist overall total body wise. And so I think it's much easier to hold yourself in a good position if you have slightly more strength to like carry everything. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that's a double whammy where you could think about it more because you are stronger and you're stronger. So you're able to carry yourself in a more proper position on the bike. Yeah. I've been doing much more strength training than I have in the past much more. So, and guess what? I'm not jacked and guess what? I'm not super heavy either. <laughs> so <laughs> I wish that I could, you know, captain America, my way up to the jack top there, but it doesn't work. So, yeah. And that will happen if you, if you have to just eat a ton. Yeah, exactly. You, yeah, right? it, it doesn't happen unless you eat a ton. Uh, cause mm -hmm. you won't gain, mm -hmm. you have to have a caloric surplus. Yep. So it was awesome to race. And thank you so much to all the podcast. There were tons of you that were on the course when we were racing off the course and cheering us on, or we got to meet throughout the week. It was just so cool to meet you all again and see you all. It's been a long time. Uh, racing is pretty great. I'm excited that it's back. So, 
Uh, polarized training plans. Uh, this is a question from Steve on this. He says, what's the plan to assess the effectiveness of the experimental polarized training plans? Are they to be graduated and sit alongside the regular lineup of plans? And do they potentially get integrated into the other plans? For example, integrating these principles into traditional sweet spot base, that sort of a thing. He says, thus far, I've been enjoying these base phase or the base phase of polarized training and the break from uh, the sweet spot training that I've been doing over the years. But from what I can see, the compliance rate of the tougher threshold workouts is quite low. So whatever the outcome, I hope they stick around in some form. Y'all are the best and five stars all the way. So, uh, Nate, do you want to take this one? You're probably best answer. I will it. take it. Yes. <laughs> okay. So probably not graduated alongside. These are, these are designed as a signal for adaptive trainings, machine learnings part. And so as we get more and more data and as our sophistication of what we can predict for what will be the right workout for you, uh, that then gets put in. And in, in general, I think over the years, what the, the trend will be is less of a, I'm doing this training plan kind of thing to more of, I have this much time to train the system then tells you what to do that that's the that's the goal of where we want to go um so that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have 15 different training styles right on there and then you kind of pick which one you want to do it's more of i can train this much here are my goals here's my history and now we then give you what it wants or what what we think or what, what adaptive training thinks is best for you and by having these structured polarized training plans is that we have a very clear signal inside of people executing uh, this approach. And that is the, the kind of the purpose behind it. And yep. now, now the timeline on that, I'm not sure because, uh, it's, there's two parts. One, we have to have the system to that level that can do that to do it. But also, uh, there could be the, the, the fact that AT never gives somebody polarized training because the, it, it doesn't, it didn't outweigh other things that people have been doing, um, mm -hmm. for you. And it might give some people's in my people, other reasons. I'm like, I'm not sure. That's the interesting, that really fun part. Yeah, that's the exciting part, right? Is when it will be able to suggest a training methodology for you based on how you've been doing recently, your goals, all that stuff. So mm -hmm. that's the end goal. And uh, Steve, do you have any questions on it? I'm following it. I think Pete is following a polarized plan right now. Maybe not. Oh, uh, no, he was. And then we went e biking. So, yeah. Whoa. Have we, I don't even know if we've covered that you on the podcast. Crashed my bike? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. did. We didn't tell you, Nate. That's why. That's why you don't know. <laughs> you know that I Shoot. actually crashed bikes a few times. <laughs> didn't you break something riding that bike? No, I wait that bike. I broke yeah, my ribs, ribs riding that bike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, two yeah. for I two. Broke my epic too. My epic top tube is broken. Uh, what? So, yeah. yeah, I need to get that replaced. So at least it's not me. Man, sad day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pete, Pete, what did you break really quick? We should cover. Um, that. I fractured my scaphoid and I tore a ligament in my thumb. And, uh, so I'm off for, I've it's skiers thumb for those who know. Um, mm. so, uh, I'm, I'm allowed to ease back into things, but I've, I've been taking the last couple of weeks off. I've been using train now once a week to stay sane <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> but were you sending it though, when you broke it? Yes, <clears throat> I was. Cool. Yeah. It's on video, actually. I think I think John could send it to you. I have the video. video. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When Pete spins out and crashes down on the on the, yep, yeah, that was when. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. P vine's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> That'll happen. Okay, James' question. He says, "I love your work and the podcast. I really appreciate the scientific and large scale way that you approach that you are approaching how to get faster. And please keep it up. We're happy to do so, James." Does this question occurred to me earlier while listening to Nate talking about performance at altitude. It's well known that high altitude means lower performance. And although I've not read much around the subject, I assume this is because of air density being lower. So less oxygen is available for our bodies and he's nailed it there. So good job. And he says, this got me wondering if there's a direct correlation between air density and power performance. I know it affects aerodynamics massively, but I'm just thinking about the human effects here. So the reason I ask is because air density also varies to a smaller degree at sea level, depending on weather conditions. Can these small variations in air density be causing fractional changes in our day-to-day -day performance? Maybe the cause of those quote off days that we all get sometimes. Many thanks from James. Amber, this is like, <laughs> we were talking about this in the planning meeting. You've heard uh, like, like here tell plenty of stories and, and lore about this sort of thing, right? All throughout your career. Oh yeah. It's funny. Over, yeah. Over the years, you hear all kinds of everything that ranges from superstition to some interesting interpretations of other 
scientific principles, but it's funny because I have had a lot of teammates over the years who re really genuinely are convinced of, oh, low pressure system coming through, training is going to be off. And it's, <laughs> it's I, to me, I got a kick out of it. I thought it was great, but I mean, for them, it was a very real thing. So I'm really curious to hear your deep dive on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. I did as, as about as deep as a Jonathan dive gets on this. So this is definitely not a chatter amber deep dive, but, um, to give you some context first. So, and, and this happens. So, uh, air pressure is constantly fluctuating. There's less fluctuation at sea level than there is at higher elevation at higher elevation. You have greater fluctuation, but, um, we'll go into this really quick. So at like a thousand feet, you have roughly 98.6% of your aerobic power creating abilities, uh, it's about at 98.6% of what it would be at sea level. And then if you go to 5,000 feet, that drops to about 91% and 10,000 feet it drops to 79%, which is why people at Leadville have to drop down their power targets from what they would normally be, right? Or any sort of high elevation race. So that's kind of some context about how, why are your performance dropping at elevation? So does the same thing happen when you have barometric pressure fluctuations in a day-to-day -day manner? So looking at this, if you assume that you have a 70 degree day, which is about 21 degrees Celsius, uh, going from zero to 250 feet can produce as much as a nine millibar difference in pressure. Now I know that millibars, nine millibars. Probably, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh my so God. I know millibars probably doesn't make much sense to us. Right. So, but I promise it will be relative to something coming up here. So, but if you look at the typical variance in your barometric pressure and wherever you're living, once again, probably higher fluctuation at high elevation, but marginally. So you're looking at like a 0.7 millibar difference in a stormy winter month, or like 0.4 millibars difference from day to day during a summer month. That's going to be more or less consistent weather. So that's the equivalent of rising up 19 and a half feet or 11 and a half feet in elevation. So really the conclusion on this is that it's equivalent of you just changing your elevation by 10 to 20 feet. So no, it doesn't have a meaningful effect on your performance. But the interesting thing, and like you mentioned in this case, uh, James, it has a profound effect on your ability to travel through air that absolutely does matter. So I want to and say a different way, John, it has, it doesn't have a huge impact on your power output, but it will on your speed. Absolutely. Especially yep. if you're going really fast. Yep. The faster you go, the more impact it has. Right. So, and this, this is something interesting. So for like an hour record example, when we had Brad Wiggins do his, and then Victor Campanertz do his, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm butchering those names. Um, but I'm sure you know who I'm speaking about. Um, so, um, but when they did that, uh, Brad Wiggins went 54.526 kilometers. That was his hour record distance. And Campanerts did 55.089 kilometers. So it was like just about 1% difference. But if you look at the actual air pressure, the barometric pressure on that day, Wiggins had 20% higher barometric pressure. He was down at London in sea level while Campanerts was up in Mexico at Aguas Calientes, which is like 6,000 feet, way, way less pressure up there. So it's tempting to say, wow, what? could have been done if Wiggins had that sort of air pressure difference. Could he have actually had a record that would have been unbeatable, but it really can affect your, your performance quite a lot. I'm not sure how best bike split really like weights everything. And it's hard to get a full apples to apples comparison, but if you watch, there's a video and get ready to drink about Keegan doing his white <laughs> rim attempt when he got it back. And when he did that, we were looking at best bike split. And later on in the day, there was a significant drop in barometric pressure, significant being like 0.3 millibars, something like that. And it was showing that it was significantly faster without a big change in wind conditions uh, when he was doing, spending more time out there on course with lower air pressure. So it is something to be considered, but if you have a TT with the start time, you can't change it anyway. If you have something yeah. like an FKT you're going for and you can choose the time, then yeah, it really does make sense. So for the world record stuff that, uh, the sea level versus 6,000 feet, the, or about 1800 meters, 2000 meters. The thing is that once you go up, you also get less, uh, aerobic performance because of the, the lower air density and they, people doing math, 6,000 feet is like the sweet spot. So that's mm -hmm. where you, you, you're not impacted as much, but the air pressure is low enough that you can go fast. So if you're doing a time trial, that's why all these people, these records get broken in Mexico city. And I believe when they had the Olympics there too, a while, a long time ago, they mm. broke a bunch of records there. Also, uh, Satley, where we have time trial, isn't that like 6,000 feet also? 
and then I think national. It's like, yeah, I think it's really close to that, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's very flat. So that's another place where the national records in the U.S. That's a 40k TT course that used to be next to us um, get broken. So that's that's why you can't just Wiggins can't just have that lower air pressure and be at sea level. It's not possible unless they did something crazy to the. I don't know the, the velodrome. velodrome and pumped it. Yeah, that would be cheat. I don't think they would allow that though. Yeah, it sounds they like do we need a trainer road velo velodrome with extra oxygen and lower pressure. And fully sealed off compartments, yeah, yeah. you know, so that we can control the pressure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they actually did do that for his hour record attempt, though. They uh, With Wiggins, they actually changed the temperature. Um, humid air is strangely faster than dry air, but cold air is slower than warm air. So they actually ended up making that velodrome very warm, warmer than they had anticipated to counter for that pressure drop. But then that ended up also probably ad, ad, like adversely affecting his physical performance, right? Because it was slightly warmer. Um, from the Science of Getting Faster podcast that we did with Dr. Chris Minson, he was mentioning that roughly like the ideal temperature for human performance was around 59 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So that's, you know, I don't know, that's probably somewhere around like 15 degrees Celsius, I would think somewhere around there. Um, but that's like, you know, that that's pretty chilly uh, if you've ridden in that, those sort of conditions, but that's where you get into ideals uh, for human performance. So super interesting question to think about. I've always wondered the same thing. If my bad days were caused by just a bad pressure system and <laughs> the wives tale is debunked. Uh, sadly, you, so. you climb up 15 feet and you're like, this is over. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's where i struggle with climbing oh my god <laughs> that's, like, <laughs> that's exactly it, it. <laughs> yeah yeah um okay so angus's question he says i have a question geared mainly to amber and possibly chad chad's out but um we'll try to do our best to represent chad here and he says years ago when i transitioned out of competitive sport i really struggled with sport if it wasn't at 100 or at the level that i used to be i was unhappy with myself and consequently didn't enjoy the activity I've since developed what I believe is a healthy relationship with sport. I started train a row with plan builder in December of 2020, and I'm really enjoying the process of training for the sake of training with no particular goal. I just picked a date for a year out for my a race, which is a really common approach that we tell people to take. If you don't have anything in particular that you want to prepare for, I think I'd like racing, but I'm reluctant to do so. I'm focused on my work and have a kid on the way. And I'm happy with that. As I see it, my training currently is a part of my, and he says, attempt at, in parentheses, balanced life, balanced, healthy life. Because I'm a very competitive person, it's not that I like winning, it's that I hate losing. Uh, he says, as are many of my friends with whom I would be racing, I worry that beginning to race would lead me down a rabbit hole where I end up either spending too much time obsessing about racing or feeling unhappy with my results and wishing I was spending more time and money to get faster. This is why the question is geared toward Chad and Amber. I get the impression, and he mentions, he says, and I could be wrong, that Nate and Jonathan are very driven toward racing and results. That's uh, that's very much the case for me. But I think through the pandemic, I've become more process oriented too. I've been, I've learned to enjoy training. Uh, it says, and Chad and Amber do a great job of focusing on enjoying the process and training for the sake of training. Uh, for example, Chad runs and rides and does weights and drinks beer and less Nate is teasing and <laughs> jokes. That doesn't stop Chad. He, he's, he's a man yeah. of his own decisions there. Uh, he says, uh, and he seems to be happy with that. What advice or suggestions do you have for people who just want to suffer because it feels good to suffer? And how do I and other trainer road users who are in a similar position maintain a good relationship with training? How does one strike that balance between pushing for progress and letting it overcome your focus. He also yeah, says, P.S. I gave you five stars in the Apple podcast app. Uh, and you can do that. If you're listening right now, you can rate it. Just go to whatever app you're using and you can give us a five-star rating. If we don't deserve five stars, reach out to us at trainroad.com slash podcast and tell us how to improve. We like constant improvement. So Amber, um, or actually uh, Pete, do you want to start off on this one? We should probably define like, or what's your definition of competitive? Because being competitive is many times like uh, it, it's 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 very much maligned by a lot of people and it gets a yeah. bad reputation. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what we we talked about right at the beginning. I, I think competitiveness gets a bad rap. Um, as you guys all know who work with me and we're competitive here at Trainer Road with each other, um, whether that's cycling or projects or typing the fat, you know, anything is any <laughs> we can be competitive with anything. Um <laughs> But what I what I think is important is you got to remind yourself that being competitive just means that you believe that you can do something better and you can improve so you can take a realistic look at yourself, pick something to improve, improve upon and then improve upon it and then try again. Um, and so it's not that you're directly head to head 
battling someone like Brandon and I do all the time. I just believe I can be better and <laughs> bring that closer to my peak level for what I'm doing. Better um, than you, not better than yes. Brandon. That's like, it's, it's no, all about better. self. Yeah, exactly. So I, when you're competitive, you're really competing against yourself all the time because you believe you're capable of more. And so I think people have to remind themselves that that constant improvement that we do uh, is what competitiveness is. And so when you're constantly improving yourself, you really are competitive because you care enough and spend the time and energy to uh, examine, like measure and do it again and be better. Um, and I think we all do it in, in many different facets of our life, but I don't think it should have the negative connotation that it has like in the world. So it just depends on how much it like makes you feel horrible, right? If it makes true. you feel horrible, then it's not a good thing. If it drives you to improve and you're okay. Uh, so the losses, I'm like, Ooh, this is a chance to grow. I just learned mm -hmm. something about myself. Right. And I know I'm never going to be the best in cycling. That's the wrong sport to say you're going to win every time. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is not <laughs> a lot of people go their whole lives, not winning a single thing. Mm -hmm. And and that's fine. And you can still improve and grow as a person. You learn stuff about yourself. Uh, that's all amazing. But when you like to John, John, uh, say John's probably more, more on the competitive side. I, I know he is. And then he had that 15 minutes to do it. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to go back to my life. Mm -hmm. That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's hard to do that. Right. Amber, like it's, um, you can kind of lose track or lose perspective of, of, of it within competition. For sure. And I, I agree with everything that Pete has said. I mean, I think that people, th there's a thought that competition is a zero sum game. You either win or you lose. And it's this kind of hardcore, you know, like tough, tough love. And it's not, it's not accurate because really what competition is about, and we've talked about this before is it's a cooperative effort. Like Pete was saying, it's about pushing each other to be better. So a lot of people can get really far improving on something on their own because they are benchmarking themselves against themselves. But oftentimes, and I know this is the case for me and for a lot of us, I can push myself really hard on my own, but I can never push myself as hard on my own as I can if I have a competitor next to me. My competitor is the one that really creates an environment where I I have to dig deeper than I thought that I could. And that's, it's in the competitive arena when you have the presence of competitors that you can really discover new depths of will, new levels of strength, and that's all part of that growth process. And so in that sense, your competitors are your allies in this process of self-improvement and trying to become better. And so, and you're doing the same for, the, for your competitors. Your presence is helping them discover new strengths that they didn't know that they had. So it can be a really cooperative effort. Unfortunately, not everyone sees it this way. And so sometimes it's hard to maintain that growth mindset. It's hard to maintain that mindset of cooperation when the people around you are really kind of twisting the meaning of competition to be something much more toxic than it really is. I mean, the true nature of, com I think actually even the etymology of the word compete means to seek with. It's a cooperative effort. You are seeking to improve along with your competitors, but people will leverage competition to be bullies and jerks. And so sometimes if you're in a group of people or you're in an environment where that more toxic definition, zero sum definition of competition is what's being adopted, it takes a lot of diligence and effort to maintain a really positive growth oriented mindset in that. So uh, I'll, I'll just say it's not easy. Uh, but the more you do it, that also, it affects the people around you too. So you can be a positive influence on the people around you when you're, when you're really cultivating that kind of a mindset. Mm -hmm. Another awesome thing in this mindset is being on a team because mm -hmm. you don't have to win. You have a role and yeah. that you can do, and you can help and you can be part of a team win. Uh, but you don't, it's so hard to win in cycling. So, so, so hard. Uh, yeah. and a lot of it's, uh, genetics, right. Or, or lifestyle and stuff, but Pete was on cliff bar and so many people on that team, they don't win, but they have very important roles. And then they add to the success of the team. Is that right, Pete? Yeah. And it feels just as valuable to like, uh, rise to the occasion, compete and do what you were supposed to do and have someone else succeed. That's, that's almost more valuable for me, right? Like, I feel like it, it, it hits at a deeper level where you sacrifice something and it all worked out and then they kind of finished it off, um, which is, it, I think that finding the enjoyment, um, is the really important part. And Amber, that was your career, right? 
<laughs> I mean, you, you yeah. have you have more wins than all of us combined, but mm -hmm. also you uh, you you were the teammate to help out people, right? Yeah, most of the time it wasn't my job to win. Most of the time I was there to help somebody else win. And I totally agree with that. That's actually a wonderful way to kind of insulate yourself. Because if you can get on a team that has a wonderful mindset and you can create a really strong culture within your team and you show up to a race and there happen to be people there who are kind of negative and toxic, it's really going to affect you so much less when you're surrounding yourself most of the time with that team of people that are, are really adopting a healthy mindset. And that team, uh, that te I think the best team culture is the culture of execution. How well did we execute? Then afterwards you're like, oh, we should have done this differently or this differently. Not, hey, you weren't strong enough. Why did you get dropped on that climb? It's, it's more of the timing and kind of the dance that you do as your team. And that's the super fun part. And there's always room for improvement. Uh, there's never an, an end. So you can't, you don't like, although you might win the race. That's another thing too. You win the race, but you come back and you go, you know what? There are the five things we could have done better. That's mm -hmm. what championship mm -hmm. teams do, right? They they come down and they after they win, they figure out what they could have done better because everyone makes mistakes. That's the kind of team that sounds really super fun. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of there's a lot of fulfillment when you achieve something. There's more fulfillment, I feel like, when you achieve something as a team. And like let's say that you win the race, but it's all because of a collective team effort versus you doing it alone. I do feel like there's greater value in yeah. that. And I've had situations where we've had a plan and I haven't stuck to the plan and I've won. And I feel pretty bad. Like it doesn't feel good. Like there's, there's a lot of value in doing that uh, together as a team. And that's one of the cool parts about road racing for, for me. I, I'm, I'm a hyper competitive person. I've had to learn to compartmentalize it over my life because even as a very little kid, it completely overtook all aspects of my life. Right. And the way that I, I had to learn to prioritize and certain priorities fall ahead of the competition of sport that I'm focusing on. So for me, you know, it's like family, health, work, bikes, church. I have a set of priorities, right? And within those priorities, I need to make sure the cycling is falling in the right spot. If, if the competitive, cause I can let that competitive drive will drive cycling right up to the top every single day, if I allow it and it will become the most important thing. And I will throw everything in my life. I, it can be burning around me and I wouldn't care because I can be so hyper-focused on the competitive aspect, but it's really about finding what matters most to you and making sure that those priorities stay within the right, the rightful place. And then the competition, I feel like it kind of stays within bounds and it doesn't trespass into other aspects of your life. So in this case, I can totally understand Angus, the apprehension that you would have because you've experienced this in the past, but also trust yourself. Uh, you're, you're an adult and you have a kid coming along the way and you have a job and you have all these things. You're, you're a high functioning person and you can absolutely prioritize and still have competitive value in your life that you get from sport. You just have to make sure that it doesn't, you know, jump those bounds and something Amber, this is like leading into your story here, but when you do this, it'll be a different sort of thing. You used to be like, you used to win everything. It sounds like Angus. And now you may find yourself like really fighting for top five or really fighting to just do one thing or another, but that doesn't mean that you can extract the same or even more joy potentially out of just chasing something different within the sport. It doesn't have to be what you once did because like at different points in your career, you will reach highs, you will reach lows. And if you entirely base your competitive spirit upon the highs that you once had, it gets tough, right? And like you have this with swimming your whole life, Amber, or swimming yeah. to cycling, everything. Big time. I think that there's, we often talk about how fun it is to get started in something because you make such huge gains right away. Like all of your improvements, you just improve by leaps and bounds. And the further along you get, the harder it is to get a uh, 3%, 2%, 1% improvement. And so when you just getting into a sport and you're improving quickly, there's almost no downside, right? Cause you're either going to learn something and make some huge improvement, or if you mess up, it's okay. Cause you didn't know any better. Cause you're just a rookie. And this was definitely the case for me in swimming. And then it was again, the case for me in cycling. My advantage in cycling was I'd been through it in swimming. And so I had learned some really valuable lessons there. And so when I was a swimmer, I came in and I had some really good early success and it was great. And you have that kind of built an excuse of being a rookie if something doesn't go well. So there's no downside. There's no threat really. But then you start to accumulate some good results and then people start to expect things from you and you start to expect things from yourself. And now this downside starts creeping in because now there's a threat of failure. There's a threat of disappointing yourself, of disappointing others. That possibility starts to feel like a, a real threat. And 
and Angus even mentions this in his question, it's not as much that he likes winning, it's that he really, really hates losing. And I think that that's kind of where this comes in, right? Is that that fear of failure. And it might not be a fear of failure specifically, but it's just that there's a much worse feeling <laughs> associated <laughs> with falling short. Um, and I remember there was one point in my swimming career where I was kind of on this upward trajectory and I'd had this really good meet and it was the best meet I'd had so far in my career. And I really felt, I mean, I had I was like 16, you guys. I felt like that was it. I had just peaked. And I said to my coach, it sucks to get to the top because the only way to go is down. Yeah. <laughs> In retrospect, yeah. it seems so funny. But at the time, from my limited perspective, that's really genuinely how it felt. I was so terrified mm -hmm. of falling short of that and disappointing people. Um, and the best thing anyone could have told me at that time is, honey, you are nowhere near the top. <laughs> There's so much further to go. And as, as harsh as that would have been in the moment, I think it would have been actually very, very comforting. And I think that that's one of the things that you can kind of reframe this as there, there's always going to be another bike race. Always. I mean, unless, unless it's 2020, but there's always, yeah. <laughs> there's always going to be, <laughs> right? yeah. there's always going to be another opportunity to try again and to improve. And so if you look at it as a path of mastery, which is never ending, you're always going to learn something. There will always be something that you can improve. It, it makes it a lot easier and it, it helps to sort of reframe that, that threat of disappointment and failure. Amber, do you have any tips for reframing that for basically re reprogramming how the brain works in those moments when you feel <laughs> the fear of failure driving you toward non-productive ways instead of productive ways or anything like that? Yeah, for sure. And, and I just want to share too, that was in my swimming career and I've been going through this more recently. So in 2018, I was going to retire from, from the sport, from cycling. And I ended up having to end that season really early because I got a concussion. And so one of my big goals on this side of full-time racing was I, I wanted to have a really healthy relationship with my bike. I really, I didn't want to have the sense I didn't want to carry the sense of obligation to always be fit and always be at a certain level with me into retirement. And so it's a process of breaking habits of thought and it's not easy. Okay. So you probably have a lot of habits of thought that are associated with how you conceptualize competition, how you concept conceptualize failure and disappointment and breaking those habits of thought is not easy. So the first step is that self-awareness. So build in a habit of checking your mindset. And this is something that I did, um, gosh, for probably at least a year after that concussion was I'd check in with myself before I go for a ride and I'd say, okay, what's my motivation here? Do I, am I getting on the bike because I feel like I have to, cause I'm worried that I might lose fitness or am I getting on the bike because I'm actually really looking forward to just pedaling and moving my body and being outside. And I would stop myself and not ride if my motivation was coming from a more toxic place of you have to get out and ride because that's what you do. And if you don't, you're not a real cyclist, you know, mm -hmm. that inner critic. And it was hard, but I had that One luxury. On, on that really, really quick, yeah. Amber, I just want to point out, that's interesting because that's not like fear of failure. Mm -hmm. That's like negative self-talk, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between the two. I, right. I, I feel like the two are assimilated a lot of the time in the sense that like, fearing failure is just, oh, well, that's negative self-talk, so remove that. But that's an interesting difference that you have. It wasn't that you were fearing failure. It was a that you had bit. that negative self. Oh yeah, or sure. But you also had that negative self-talk part where it was going even deeper than that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so. two pieces, exactly. So there's there's that inner critic that's jumping out. And then there's also, but the inner critic loves to jump the train of, oh, if you don't do this, then you're, mm -hmm. you're going to lose fitness. And so the, the the definition of failure shifted, right? It was, it was no longer, you're not going to win bike races. It was just that you're not going to be as fit or you're not going to look a certain way. Um, and, and trying to let go of all of that as best I could. So building a habit of ch checking in with yourself, what is your mindset? Where is your mind at? And, and building in bumpers for you, it might not be, okay, I'm not going to get on my bike if, unless I have the right mindset. I had that luxury at that point in my life. Cause I didn't, no one cares <laughs> when you're retired, if you're fit or not. So it was okay. Um, but a couple more things that are really helpful. One is to add cues to your pre-ride and your pre-race routines. And these could be like little visual things. Maybe even it's a picture of your family on your top tube, um, but little cues to remind you of the mindset that you want. You know, maybe that's to remind you of 
what your priorities outside of cycling are. Maybe that's to remind you of a growth mindset, but little, little things that can kind of just like help get your mind into a good space, the space that you want it to be in when you're going out to race or when you're going out to ride. Um, in psychology, we talk about triggers. So the other side of this is you can identify triggers. What are some triggers that push you into old thought patterns? Can you recognize those? And as soon as you start to recognize those, can you start to redirect your thoughts into a, into a better framework? But the opposite of a trigger is a glimmer. And so that's those cues that are, instead of triggering you into a bad thought pattern, they're triggering you into a really positive thought pattern. So you want to have those little glimmers or cues in your pre-race or your pre-ride routines. And I think just in general, this path of mastery, it doesn't end. And you can be really, really serious about improving. And you can take that path of improvement really, really seriously without taking yourself too seriously. And that's the piece where you can really start to separate from that fear of failure and disappointment. If you're not taking yourself too seriously, eh, it's okay. You're just going to get out and try again. It'll be fine. I, I personally like the, so my motivation to get on the bike or get into the gym is I like the, okay, here's a challenge that's within my, I can do this challenge and I know it's going to be hard and I'm going to do it. And I feel awesome in the middle and afterwards. It's going to hurt, but it's, it's good. The same thing with a race, right? This mm -hmm. is a challenge, Leadville, huge challenge, right? Uh, the, the hard part is, is what, if you don't rise to that challenge, if you get into this, this really like, oh, horrible feeling and that's actually with right now, I plugging train road, but levels amazing for me because mm -hmm. this was actually where we bought it. We, we bought it, built it because it allows me to say, what is the appropriate step challenge? Cause if you don't know if it's the right amount of step, it's easy then to uh, to not rise up to that challenge. And then you can feel bad about yourself. And that's not, no one wants that at all, but you should uh, be aware of that. Second thing that Amber said is that at the very beginning, you get so fast, right? <laughs> yeah. Pro tip, stop training for like a month or two and do it again. <laughs> and then stop training, do it again. Every time you come back faster, it's that, that you come back a lot faster on the ramp. Just do it over and over again. Pete, you've done that a few times too, right? It's, yep. it's, you're always improving. It's like one day of not improving and then a whole bunch of days of improving. Uh, so it can be good. Uh, and then Angus too, the, the other thing I would say for the results, is it internal or external? Are you afraid that people will see that you didn't get this result? How many times, uh, and I've had this with a podcast too. I think I'm over it now, but before in the past, uh, that people quit a race because they don't want the result on their official records. This happens in like marathon running, it happens in triathlons. They don't want to show that they did a, a 14 hour Ironman or a four hour marathon when they thought they could do a 10 hour or something else. And they say, ah, you know, it wasn't my day or I had stomach issues, so I had to pull out. And that is more of not letting other people see the result. Um, I think Angus, oh, I just spilled coffee on myself. Um, <laughs> Angus, this is a great, uh, <laughs> this is a great, this is a great thing to talk to a therapist about, right? What are mm -hmm. your true motivations? This question we're doing unlicensed therapy right now, one of our own experiences, <laughs> but this, <laughs> it's like half the show now. Um, this is exactly what someone can help like realize what it is. And I bet this bleeds into other areas of your life or what is the motivation behind this? Why can't you, uh, compete without feeling bad without winning. Cause that is a really tough spot to be in. Right. Mm -hmm. Really, really tough yeah. spot. The yeah, final I, thing I would say with all this is that, Oh, sorry. Sorry, Amber. Um, oh. it, it's that it, it's that it will change whatever your motivations are. They'll change and shift and be okay with that. Don't hold yourself to a specific thing. And in many cases, Angus, this is relatable for me. If you have success, you hold that success. You don't allow your motivations to change then it gets really tough. So whether it comes from fear, whether it comes from enticement, whether it comes from just purely intrinsic, like love centered motivation, whatever it is, uh, you can use all three of those in whatever portion feels appropriate. And as long as it's not putting you in a negative place, and as long as it's elevating different aspects of your life, then it's good. So, um, be flexible with yourself. And, and I bet that you'll actually find just as much, if not more enjoyment, once you reshuffle that deck for yourself, instead of playing by the old rules, it'll, it'll really help. So Amber, I, I, I cut you off. Did you have anything else to, to add on it? <laughs> I was just going to second what Nate said. So I started working with a sports psychologist many, many years ago, and it was incredibly helpful. And now that I'm not racing anymore, I'm still working with a therapist and it's awesome. And it's not, as Nate said, it's not for any one thing in particular, but having some time set aside on a regular basis 
to sit down and reflect, it's really incredibly helpful and it can be really, really powerful. So I'll just, uh, I'll just put in my two cents for that. And then I'll add to that, that right now, a lot of insurance companies, if you do have health insurance, a lot of insurance companies are waiving co-pays for, um, virtual sessions. So it's something to think about. Just throw awesome. that out there. And I want to say too, I, you don't necessarily need a sports psychologist, I think, because that is, that it's right. pretty hard to find. Um, a regular therapist, this is the competitiveness that's very common in so many people in, in lives. Uh, and two other things, I was in marriage counseling before. It's different. Like mm -hmm. if you're in marriage counseling, you could do both. Uh, and then also, uh, the first person might not be your person. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting it, go, it's just like dating, right? Like if you're or coaching, if it's, the, coaching yep. yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. it might, you could be, I've seen people do this. I went to a therapist. I knew everything they were saying. Therefore, all therapists aren't good. Imagine if you right. that for coaching. You went to one coach. They gave you bad work. It's you're like, all coaches are bad. They're all the same. Not so at all. There's a big range uh, in skill mm -hmm. level and just personality match and that sort of thing. For sure. Let's get into some rapid fire questions. Byron, Nate, this one's from you. It's from Byron. He's he's six four and he's trying to find jackets that are long enough for long arms. I figured this is something that probably more than just you have experienced or are curious about on the podcast. Okay. I do. I thought of it. I do have one suggestion. It's super expensive, but it's cycling. Mm. So it, they, it all is. Yeah. It's the mission workshop jacket. I like that. Pete turned me onto this brand and I have like, oh, I love their bags, but they're so expensive. Um, yeah. And I, their vest is amazing too. I really like their vest, very packable. Um, that's the only one that I've seen because it has to be skinny enough in the body and long enough in the arms. And I don't like a flappy jacket. Uh, there's probably more brands. I think if anyone knows of 6'4", 6'6", 6'7", kind of long arm person, uh, if you're 6'1", don't give us suggestions because they don't fit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some people, I don't know. It's, Whole yes. Other thing. Uh, <laughs> go, uh, go with the forum to this episode, episode something 307, 307, 307 and put yeah. in some, some brand recommendations. But the, what I do too is online, I'll buy like a medium or a large of a brand. Cause you never know in cycling if a medium is going to be like Euro medium or American medium. And then, yeah. uh, you try them on just return one. Uh, cause the worst is when you get the, the wrong fitting thing oh, and yeah. you know, it doesn't bring joy and you never want to wear it. it just sits in your closet for ever and yeah. it's expensive and how many things do we have of that right like <laughs> too many <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure mark has a bunch of rapid fire ones seemingly focused on mountain biking he says but this one is is universal number one do you close the water bottle after sipping or leave it open uh, I, I leave it open but then every time i try to reopen it when i drink it <laughs> <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yes I, I, when I used to use Camelback bottles that have like the little like jet or whatever valve thing, you obviously just left those open. But with, uh, I always close mine. I don't, I don't know why I don't need to, I mean, heaven knows what I'm putting in my mouth anyway, from all the dust and stuff that gets all over the bottle. But Amber, I think after racing in Belgium and knowing what was in the grit that was spraying all over everything, I got in the habit of closing it every time. <laughs> Yeah. Not that it did any good because there was always going to be something on the surface of it, yeah. but like there was just something yeah. about it. It just, it, it felt better to me some, somehow. Yeah. Pete. Yeah, I'm open. I, once you open it, just leave it open and then it's gone. Right. Yeah. With mountain biking, the only thing you have to worry about a cross or gravel, just bouncing around and losing, you know, getting yourself wet and covered in mix, but that would be it. Um, MTB brakes. Do you run them flat or tilted down or somewhere in between? I assume. Tilted I'm a down. You are, you're down really huh. more, more down than flat for sure. I'm more flat than down. Nate. It's whatever that angle is of your arm. I try to keep it the same angle down. So flat would be, I'd have to have my arms flat and that would be really weird. Yeah. I, I have my wrists bent on the, on the bars because if my levers are all the way down and you can't see this on the podcast, I'm so sorry, podcast <laughs> listeners, but on YouTube, if you have your wrist bent or like even straight in line, it puts a ton of stress on your thumb when you're riding. And it's pretty easy to have your hands fall forward. If you're breaking and have a lot of hand or like a lot of pressure on your hands and you're coming into a section. But, uh, so I actually have mine more up. They are not flat, but they're closer to flat than they are pointed down at like a 45 degree angle. Cause that way my wrists are bent slightly and it gives me a little bit of something to press against with my hands. And it allows me to stay more stable with my body, not put all the leverage onto my thumbs. So, but you can totally take it too far. And if you have those things way up, like enduro racers tend to do, I think it actually is, is bad. So, 
Um, okay. Another one when climbing on the hoods are all four fingers on the front of the bars, or do you split the pinky? I, I, I if you're listening to this, just you do the thing with your hands. Like he's talking about, how do you hold the hoods and, and how do you do it? I'm, I'm a pinkier. It Same. makes total sense. Uh, when your arms are flat, your yes. pinky should be there as like your, your catch all that holds you in, in the spot you're supposed to be on the hoods. Yep. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I'm, I'm a pinky rider too. Pinky stays behind rest or mm -hmm. forward. Yep. Same. I don't think I'm a pinky person. <laughs> Huh. Pinky's not going to save me. It's just going to get ripped off. It's a good point. Eh? It's not. I don't know why we do it, but we all do. I I do it. Yeah, I don't know why. Pinky's not going to save me. The pinky always stays behind. It's true. You have an extra injury if you have a, you get into a problem. Just I mean, like I'm talking like about like all the my, way down. I'm talking about my thumb holding us on the bars, and now we're talking about the pinky holding us on the bars. Like the pinky's not going to well, do this, anything. This right? part of your hand will stop it. Yeah. For sure, but the pinky, poor thing, it can't it can't hold our entire weight. So no, yeah, uh, not at all. Um, okay, white shoes with uh, no, we aren't going to cover that. Wear whatever no. socks and shoes you want. How about that? That that one works well, very well there. Um, oh, this awesome, one's though. actually good. Fat or thin grips on the mountain bike. Chad where rides the largest diameter grips I've ever seen. Like he, I don't even think he makes a full C with his hands. They're huge. It's like pool noodles on his handlebars. I don't know how they're he does very it. large. Yeah. <laughs> but he said that it's really helped with arm pumps. So maybe that yeah. like, maybe that. And also I think he's even said like, you know, like neck and like shoulder tension and everything. Like it's really helped a lot mm. with mountain biking for him. I've got a bunch of different things and I don't really know the difference. Hmm. I've done both. I think on an XC bike, I like the thin grips and on the like trail downhill bike, I do like the fat grips. It does. It did help my, with my arm pump too, was the big, bigger grips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amber, do you, do you have enough uh, experience to have grip preference yet? Nope, I don't know I've if you just do. got my one scalpel and it's OEM and <laughs> that's what I'm running. Is what it is. I run pretty thin grips. ODI elite pros are the ones that I use. Um, and go onto my Instagram and you can see how I use a razor blade to cut parts of the grips <laughs> off every time, not for weight, but because I'm fussy. So it's weight. Um, <laughs> also fussy. I measure, I, sh I shave a bit off and measure it. Shave, gram. Measure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, on an, on a fun group ride, mountain bike ride, do you obsessively lock out suspension on all climbs or just leave it? This is where I get to be an elitist, uh, specialized Epic owner and say, I just use the brain. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. I never, I never lock out. Right. Like if you don't care, just, just don't. This is what, I, uh, so when I ride my 150 SP 150, it's like a enduro bike on a long climb. I will lock out the shock. Uh, yeah. if we're doing a 20 minute climb solo or with friends, but other than that, all the other cross country bikes, they do it automatically for me. So I don't do it. Yeah. What about you on your scalpel? Uh, Amber, you've got probably a remote lockout on your bike, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, wasn't locking it out much when I was riding it. So I haven't been riding it much lately. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's probably good. Yeah. Probably a good thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I keep it open almost all the time. Unless I'm, I do a lot of training, almost all my training on the road, on my mountain bike. And when that happens, I leave it locked, uh, which the brain just fully on, um, on both of those, but that's, that's it. Um, otherwise it's almost always open. There are certain bikes though, like Trek I'm thinking of in particular, like their top fuel that they had. That one, if you didn't lock it out, it was a very different performing bike. So like, hmm. it really depends on the bike. Uh, some bikes just bounce all over the place. So, um, cool. Okay. The last one is a bit from him is a bad form for, or manners to climb to the top and then climb back down and ride with your slower friends to the top. I love it. People used to do this to me. I liked it. It helped yeah. me at the very end. It like pushed me. I didn't feel like it was, uh, doing anything bad. I was just like, well, I get to ride with friends for more often. Yeah. Brandon does that. He's done that with me countless times on climbs. And I know Brandon is, is getting more climbing, which he's all about. And then it also gives me somebody to kind of squeeze words in between breaths with at the end of, of the climb. So I, yeah, I appreciate it too. I think it's great. As long as you're not, you know, riding up and being super chatty while your friend is obviously hyperventilating and you expect yeah. an answer. <laughs> or like turning around and coming back and, oh, great to see you here. I was at the top five minutes ago. Like don't be that person, you know. Like, <laughs> don't, do, no. don't do that. I've done yeah, that if you're I'm just... like, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're just coming back to hang out, I think it's great. You know, and you can always just ask your friends because people might have personal preferences. If you drop back, this... don't drop them again. That would be yeah, really mean. That's it. <laughs> that's like, <laughs> that would be really mean. <laughs> uh, I think riding behind them is kind of nice. 
Uh, yeah. It just feels mm -hmm. like someone's there with you. Uh, right. I've been the slow person though, where I'm like, we're, there's a lot of this climb left. How do you already at the top and descend and come to me? I'm like, this isn't, did you, did you turn around early? This is insane. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Pete, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, as long as you don't drop me again. And I think slotting behind is, is nice, uh, where you can, mm -hmm. you just ride the rest of the climb at their pace and then it's camaraderie and feels good. And there's no yeah. pressure to like, yeah, there's no mm -hmm. pressure to keep for them to keep your wheel or something like that. Mm -hmm. For sure. But there is nice. The opposite is if they're going for a Strava KOM to help if they want it. Yeah. Headwind, you get in front. Uh, people, Brandon's done that for me too. And it was pretty awesome. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's the way to do it for sure. I uh, riding with friends is great. I've been doing that again recently too. Sorry. I know that I'm sound like a brand new cyclist, but it's all new again. It's like, Did you guys know you can race amazing. and ride with friends. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, this next one uh, says higher weekly TSS with over half of it coming from unstructured group rides or lower weekly TSS all from trainer road. I, uh, I have a hard answer on that one. <laughs> I mean, what's your goal? That's a good point. That's really yeah. like, yeah. what's your goal? I'm, I'm guessing this is pure fitness and it's going to be a, it's going to be a slide, right? Cause like what's the high, what's the low of the TSS, but mm -hmm. in general, uh, the structure training for the same TSS is always going to be more than a group ride. So group ride outside, or you do a workout for the same TSS, you normally will get farther ahead with the structured ride. And, uh, we should be able to prove this pretty soon with scoring outside workouts, outside mm -hmm. rides and structured rides to see at that same TSS, what kind of like threshold or VO two max points you get for that versus the same TSS inside. Mm -hmm. And all it depends on the, the length of the intervals and that sort of thing. And, uh, usually on out unstructured outside rides, you don't have those sustained intervals because of interruptions that you face or, or changes, fluctuations, that sort of thing, right? And just the pace of the group, right? Oh yeah. Definitely. When you're riding with other people. Yeah, for sure. I think we all probably agree with that. Right. Um, yeah. 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 There's no way that the unstructured group ride is exactly the intervals I need to get to be faster. Unfortunately. It's so frustrating. <laughs> I keep asking for it. No one respects it. Yeah. That's a good point. So now that we have the level system going inside, you can see the difference in uh VO2 max at like two minute intervals versus 215. And that 215 might be the exact extra stimulus that you need in order to be to progressive forward. Yeah. But mm -hmm. that's not and repeated five times. Uh, mm -hmm. that yeah. is not what happens in a group ride. Uh, you can get tired though. It's two minutes, not two fifteen. Come on. <laughs> you still, it, it's weird though, because you still get tired. Right. And that's because you oh, yeah. usually have one really hard capacitive effort and then all your other efforts go less and less and less. And, uh, sure. it can feel like a race too, but it's not necessarily a race or it makes you as fast as doing structured interval training. Right. For sure. Well, this question goes on to ask like, will unstructured 450 TSS make me faster than structured 300 TSS. And we, we've talked about this many, many times that not all TSS is created equal. So TSS is not the end all be all metric for what's going to make you faster. And I really like Nate's point about goals too, because, you know, we, we know that structure is going to make you faster, but we also know that consistency over a long period of time is important. So if going out and riding with your friends helps you stay motivated and happy on the bike, that is going to be beneficial, not necessarily because of the TSS, but because it's just going to help you be a happier whole person and athlete on the bike. Yeah. TSS mm -hmm. is like an overall metric, right? And it, but it's not specific to the work that was done at that specific moment and being able to differentiate that between any other effort. Um, like we mentioned when Pete did the E pacing with me before he hurt his wrist, we arrived at a pretty low power for what I thought that we would arrive at. And, but Pete, you'd said it well, you said, this is the hardest way to arrive at that TSS, right? So there's like so many different ways that you can get to 100 TSS or whatever it may be. <laughs> so it's tough to say that one is better than the other, um, just across the board, but structure, honestly, if you're trying to get faster structure is going to be delivers, it's a specific approach to get specific outcomes. And that's the and main thing. So no promise on timeline on this, but the, the vision on this is so you do your unstructured group ride. We then score that ride like it was a train road workout. And then that then impacts your training plan or train now. So you get credit for it. And it should give you some kind of a visibility of, Hey, how actually hard separate from TSS was this for increasing my fitness, which is the, mm -hmm. I think everyone wants that. And if you can mm -hmm. build that then in your training plan, it's not a big deal when you 
as Amber said, you do a group ride with your friends. It doesn't mess your training plan. We could adapt, move forward. That's definitely the, the vision because I think that's very common. And it just makes cycling more fun, more consistent over the long term, and therefore you are faster. Yep, absolutely. Next one from Charlie. Uh, Pete, we'll have you answer this one. How do you come up with all the names of the workouts? We've probably answered this before multiple times on the podcast, but uh, Pete, do you want to let them know the process? But I've never answered it. So we take the workout <laughs> descriptions and we slide them under a closet door and then someone slides back out a little piece of paper with a workout name on it. And I don't know what it's a creepy, it's a, small little hand. It partially yeah, fits yeah. under the door actually when it comes back out. It's yeah, a yeah, exactly. door. It came with the building. <laughs> And we've never <laughs> found a key to open it. It's like we've we tried. know nothing. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of weird. We occasionally yeah. hear fans in there uh, and like pick or whirl. But that's yeah, it. it's weird. We don't ask questions. We just take the names. Uh, Ryan says, "Are you? This is interesting. Are you Windows or Mac guys and gals? And which head unit brand do you use? Searching for correlations here." Uh, Mac Garmin. Matt Garmin. Matt Garmin. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm Mac, but I use all the head units because that's uh, it's part of my job description. So yep. that's how it rolls. So th hopefully this helps your, your your research here on this one, Ryan. Um, <laughs> cool. Okay, this next one, and I'm gonna fail at this one. Says, assuming you are all as nerdy as I am, which superhero in the Marvel universe? Let's make it easy and stick to the movies. Is the fastest in a 100 mile gravel ride? A lot more nuanced question than you might expect because. Please consider body type, perceived commitment to the challenge, mentality, the bike you think they have, including secret weapons, nutrition, et cetera. I don't know. I don't watch movies like ever. I'm, I'm like a, I'm, I'm a, an outlier, I guess, in that regard. So I don't know. Uh, Captain America seems like he would be in these ones. And I bet that he'd be really strong, but have a really bad power to weight ratio. But since he just said it was a hundred mile gravel ride, it's probably flat. It would be I don't horrible. Know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand superhero movies. Who, who, who is, who's your pick Pete or uh, Amber? Or Nate? I, I, I can only pick one. I mean, right. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You're obligated. There's no other way for you. <laughs> You're obligated. I won't even Four. say it. I'll just let yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I think that uh, that's just our answer, right? Mm -hmm. Period. Thor. No. Uh, I'm not, there's other like smaller characters, but for the major characters, Quicksilver, obviously he's like the, that's his power speed. But then, uh, if you get cheating, uh, Dr. Strange could just teleport over do a little portal <laughs> hey i won yeah or send change a fake, reality for everybody yeah else. send a fake version of himself up the road on a bicycle and he's just like lounging at the finish line feet up I'm yeah i'm exactly. so glad this so. is not our reality i'm so glad that instead we talk about like trading poles and skipping poles so um okay this one is from parker and we're more or less out of the rapid fire section if you can a section if you can tell parker says what type of workout should i be doing if weight loss is my primary goal and is there a way to change the training schedule and train road to meet this goal so we've mentioned this in various different forms before in the past um but it's a common question that we get genuinely every week we get this multiple times in one form or another so it's worth uh addressing because there's constantly new people finding this podcast uh, Amber, what would you say to this? Uh, if your weight loss is the primary goal, what sort of training should you do? Do the training that you're going to stick with. The The best training plan is the one that you're going to do. So that sounds really, really, really <laughs> basic, and it is. But oftentimes people get really excited about making huge changes and lots of changes and doing them all at once. And it's not always realistic. So Pick something that feels like it's going to be super, 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 super easy for you. And that will be the thing that you're probably going to be really most consistent with. Um, and then as you get consistent with it and you start improving, you can add on to it and, and get a sense for what, you know, how much you can really change. But it's all about creating those habits and creating habits is about consistency. And consistency is really about not taking on too much all at once. Mm -hmm. Uh I would, a few things not to do. I wouldn't stick with like, I wouldn't be overly concerned with like fat burning zone and like mm -hmm. fasted training and that sort of thing. Yep. Uh, over the day after that high intensity interval training, you're going to burn fat afterwards. And it's really about being a caloric deficit in order for weight loss. Um, and inside of that too, if you want to maintain muscle mass and have a caloric deficit, you need to have a high enough protein, uh, maybe around 1.8 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight. Uh, but what happens, this is what I think people don't focus enough on long-term fitness. So I would just do the training plans or, or train now and have, you know, the three intense days. And then if you have more, you could fill in with aerobic, if you're doing train now, because 
you can increase the, your, the amount of calories you burn per hour and your overall power so much. So like if you start and you say, I'm just going to do fasted aerobic rides and that's how I'm going to burn fat. Um, the, the, by the way, that doing them fasted doesn't increase the amount of fat you burn as much as just raising your FTP. Uh, and the, for me, I went from like 189, you know, and I'm in the three hundreds now, that's a huge increase for calories per hour. So if you focus on becoming fast and you look, you watch your nutrition, um, that's a great way to then have weight loss in the future. Um, but then I wouldn't, you know, fuel your workouts because what happens if you, I think what Amber's talking about, you can get in this really like, I'm going to do everything. I'm not going to eat during my rides and it works for two weeks and then you stop and then you're nowhere. If you, you feel concentrate terrible. on it, yep. <laughs> yeah. You do a six month thing. Hey, I just increased my power by 20%. Uh, I've lost weight consistently. It hasn't even been that hard. Uh, it's a gradual change, but it's change and you get to your end result. Uh, that you really want and you just have to be patient with yourself as these things are like hey it's like water cutting stone is that it yeah yes. water cutting stone yes mm -hmm. Pete, nutrition uh, yeah <clears throat> yeah i i when we were talking about this that that it kind of the main focus was if you do 50 percent of the workouts you prescribe yourself you're going to lose 50 percent of the weight or you'll be 50 percent as effective as you are losing the weight so if you can figure out a way to do a hundred percent of the training to lose weight, you will be infinitely more successful. Um, so I know that's, again, it's the, it's the basic answer, but all the, the training plan you're most excited about will get, will cause you to lose the most weight if you control all the other factors in your life. So pick what you're excited to do and don't worry specifically about days and zones and you know, it, it all is, it's going to build on itself and you'll get much further being excited and being consistent, which is really what it's all about. And the nutrition, that is the, that's really what it is. So you can train a ton and gain weight. You can not train at all and lose weight. Uh, yeah. the, the training makes the, you can get in this like really good mindset of where, uh, it's, you know, you're eating lots of vegetables and you feel great. Your fitness comes up. You're just feeling like a better person. And, uh, that can then help with nutritional choices and you get in that caloric deficit for weight loss. Uh, it's, I just, you just have to make sure you get both sides of that equation. Mm -hmm. There there's a, another way to phrase this that could help is because I assume that in this case, uh, the question is really coming Parker from like what workouts, what interval structure is best to be able to burn that, but reframe the question a bit and think, what actually burns calories and it's doing work. And if you can train yourself to do more work, you will burn more calories. That's just how that works. So the, the faster you become, like Nate said, the more capable you will be at being, at being able to shift that body composition. So over time, like, yeah, when you do sweet spot work and threshold work, yeah, it burns a ton of calories and you're spending a lot of time around there. But if you just jump straight into something and that's not what you want to do, then that's not going to be productive. So to, to hammer home uh, points that we've made here, it's about doing the training that you like, but finding a way to be consistent so that you can train yourself to do more work. If you're doing more work, you will have greater influence over shifting that body composition in the way that you want. I, another thing that is super duper fun. And it is, I've been doing this lately is you can do what's called body recomposition. So you're not really in a caloric deficit or surplus. But through weight training and through getting adequate protein, you can actually, uh, you don't turn fat into muscle, but basically you're burning fat and you're building muscle. And I am pretty much the same weight. I'm like 193 right now, but the amount of muscle mass I have is much higher and my body fat is much lower. And that is, um, it's super fun. You have to w weight train when you do it. You have to get adequate protein intake. And I, uh, I get that through uh, some protein shakes. And basically for, as a cyclist, you just have to reduce your fat, which can be hard. Uh, you have to get enough fat, of course, and I'm not sure the exact amount of uh, grams per day you can look it up, but that kind of thing, it's, you don't have to, you don't have to restrict yourself and mm -hmm. having more muscle mass at the same weight is great, um, for everybody. Right. And you just become a stronger human. We talked about it's great for all aspects of cycling. Um, and this is of course, if you're, if you're, uh, obese or morbidly obese, there's a different thing. But for those people, the, the very common cyclists that you see, I think a lot of people would like that. And, uh, it's, you probably have higher performance too. Uh, you have to train though, which I'm not, um, you know, 
ride the bike more often, which I'm not yeah. doing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get there when it's time. Um, uh, Rob's question actually dovetails really well with this. He says, I'm curious if you dial back the food intake during rest weeks. I love to eat and have a pretty significant appetite, especially during weeks of high TSS. And I have a hard time rating this in mostly from habit versus actual appetite. During rest weeks, I wonder if I should make a more concerted effort to reduce portion sizes during rest or inactive weeks, or if this is no big deal. I'm really curious how you, very meticulous bunch, deal with this. Thanks very much. Love the podcast, the software, the plans, and all that you do. Uh, thanks, Rob. So uh, this one, uh, we should probably start, even though Rob says that it's more about habit rather than appetite, or I, to reframe that, his eating habits versus hunger. But I do think that we hear, or I know that we hear very commonly from people and I feel this too. I feel hungry during rest weeks that happens. Um, and in your mind, it breaks because it's like, I'm doing less work. Why do I feel hungry? Um, Amber, do you want to kick us off with talking about that topic first? Sure. So, um, the short answer to your question, Rob is it's no big deal. <laughs> so if you want to just take that and go, we're good, but to dig into this a little bit deeper, um, your body is recovering during recovery weeks and recovering for your body isn't for you. It means doing less work for your body. It kind of means doing more work because your body is having to make more mitochondria, make existing mitochondria bigger and more efficient. It's possibly rebuilding muscle tissue, even connective tissue. There's a lot that's being built and repaired and improved in your system while you are recovering and those processes are all are what's happening during your rest week. So you're, you're resting, but there's a lot going on in your body. So just because you're not pedaling or doing intervals, doesn't mean that your body doesn't need fuel. Um, so I think part of this framing comes from this idea that you have to earn your food, right? So you should, you have to burn so many calories in order to take in so many calories. And it's important to decouple that a little bit because your, your body is always doing really, really important things that keep you alive. <laughs> like 24 yeah. seven, whether you ride bikes or not, it's doing some really important work that requires energy. It requires energy and nutrients and all the things that you get from, from food. So, you know, just because you're not riding your bike doesn't mean that your body doesn't still deserve really good nourishment. Um, and that's no less true on a rest week than it is when you're in heavy training. So I would just encourage you to, to think about the fact that your body is always doing work for you. It's always doing really, really cool, amazing things. And, um, there's that piece of it. And then I, I will get to the satiety part a little bit later. Cause I think Pete's going to cover that a bit. Yeah, it's, I, I think what you said is exactly right. Like, um, the earning thing is just mind boggling to me. Um, I know we all feel it and by looking at the science, you just, there's no, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. So I think what everybody should do is take a step back and realize that rest weeks are actually no different from training weeks from a nutritional principle standpoint. You should be eating healthy a hundred or as healthy as you can and what you're capable of a hundred percent of the time. And then you're going to add more specific fuel for higher intensity or higher volume weeks to kind of fill the void that you're creating with more work. So your actually your food is actually going to be kind of your staples are going to be much much more similar across the board, and then you're going to add more fuel specific types of food for the high volume training weeks, and then you will lessen those during rest weeks. But you will not take them away because your body, just like Amber said, is still recovering, it's still growing, it's still changing, a hundred percent of the time. And it's not like it's a light switch where you <laughs> stopped your ride on sunday at 4 p.m and boom your body's not it doesn't need any more food it's perfect <laughs> i can not eat this whole rest week uh and Sounds i will be terrible. skinnier and faster afterwards um no. but i i think if everybody reminds themselves that almost all your meals should be filling the nutritional value for your body and then you're going to add more healthy foods that are more fuel specific for pre during and post um mm. and if you can do that then rest weeks are actually no different you're just adjusting some of the sliders for fuel sources um, during the rest week. And so that's another one where you're not adjusting, you're, you're adding on to your baseline when you're training and you're not adding on to your baseline when you're recovering because you're still getting all of the fuel you need to recover and grow as a cyclist during your rest week, which is what we want. Um, we, <clears throat> we should have used this joke earlier, but calories are 
kind of like TSS, where <laughs> if you get a thousand calories from Oreos, it's way different than a thousand calories from Brussels sprouts. And if you get a, <laughs> if you get a hundred TSS from noodling, then, or you're doing, you know, 15 second all out sprints with five minutes in between, guess which are they the same? They are not the same. So, uh, <laughs> and I know which one I would rather have a bowl of during my recovery week is Oreos. probably the Oreos, but I'll eat the Brussels sprouts <laughs> because I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of calories, they are the same, but in terms of uh, health and your performance yes. and how you're gonna feel, it's gonna be very different. Uh, make right. sure that's clear. Yeah, so like per, but the interesting part about that is that you it's tempting to just look at things in terms of calories and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, well, shoot, I can just feel everything with Oreos. Um, and, and not to say that, you know, you, you can't have those sort of things as well. That's important to keep in mind. Once again, that like, yeah. you know, a balanced diet sees you eating a variety of things and not being so prohibitive with yourself as well. But, you know, with, with rest weeks for me, I don't eat less. I used to, I tried to, I felt terrible. And then I would <laughs> be bad for the rest of the build thereafter. That's just how it always seems to happen. So what I do is I double down on nutrient value during my, during my recovery weeks. So like Pete said, I have my staples. And then when I'm training, I add more carb dense foods, right? So that's when I add in more brown rice. That's when I add in more pasta. That's when I add in more sweet potatoes than I would normally eat something like that. You know, that's when I add in more of that stuff to feel that that's during the training time. When I'm not doing that, then I look at that as an opportunity to fill that same bowl to the same level, but instead I fill it with different vegetables. Uh, and I double down on that nutrient value. The thing is when you eat a lot of those particularly vegetables and that have like a ton of fiber, that sort of thing, you feel really full. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really helpful for me during rest weeks because I'll feel really hungry during a rest week. A lot of the time, because I, if I'm not eating high quality food, because I'll be eating less and then I'll be eating lower quality foods. And they're so tricky because when you have them, they're super satiating at first. And after that, they just leave you high and dry and feeling really hungry. So I will just double down on that nutrient value. Uh, what that ends up doing is it makes me feel really full and I'm getting a ton of nutrient quality, which my body's doing a lot of important work during a rest week. And so it gives the body what it needs to do. So the one thing I, I definitely try to do those, I try to avoid riding a caloric balance during the recovery weeks. Cause that's like a big concern that we all have, right? Like I'm doing less work, therefore I need to eat less. And you try to, if you try to ride that line during that recovery week, more often than not, you'll find yourself feeling deprived or feeling pretty hungry thereafter. But if you're eating really healthy foods and like we say, like, you know, whole grains, vegetables, you know, or all that stuff, you're going to find yourself feeling pretty full from actually really full from food. That's really healthy for you. So I eat more in terms of like volume. I would say if you're to like, look at it in a bowl, probably more during recovery weeks, but it's just uh, less hyper-focused toward serving energy to do my workouts. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, Amber. I was just going to say, I think that's an important point that people, when you think in terms of caloric balance, there's this I don't know, misconception that if you're in caloric balance, like if your calories in equal your calories out, you won't get hungry. It's not true, right? Because mm -hmm. the satiety that you experience is related more to, are you getting the nutrition that you need, which is not always equivalent to the calories in Pete's Oreos versus Brussels sprouts example. <laughs> so, um, you know, you might, you might be doing the math and thinking like, I shouldn't be hungry, but I'm still hungry. It might be because you're not taking in nutri like at, as nutrient dense foods. And then if you're gravitating toward nutrient dense foods, generally you will probably feel better and the satiety level will be different as well. So that's just something to keep in mind that, that the, that's another misconception about, about calories is it's not always correlated to satiety. The, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, sorry. Oh, I know. I know it's not your fault. My fault. Uh, the, uh, extreme ownership. Amber's like, sorry, you forgot <laughs> what, <laughs> what, uh, oh, I forgot again. Oh yeah. I know if you, so if you are fueling, uh, like hundred grams per hour when you're training and you do a recovery shake, I did the math on this, your actual other meals are almost the same. It's not mm -hmm. that much different. You might have yeah. one more snack in there, but that's really kind of close. So if you do a recovery week, you just have that same, those same kind of meals. And, uh, you know, I like the idea of flexibility inside of there and not being super duper rigid. Cause I think rigid, cause I think that is a lot bad long-term, but that's good. And I, I kind of want to do, 
So I go through TikTok spurts where I make my own. <laughs> and uh, now that I am a, a single man in his own house, I need to make my own food all the time. And I, I'm trying to do as easy as possible and as healthy as possible. Should do some really quick, I don't know, if I say it, maybe I'll do it. Really quick, low value, low thing, like little videos about making something super duper duper fast. I value low stress. <laughs> not right? low value yeah 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 yeah. just like it's ridiculous yeah. everyone will be like of course pe people do that but i do it almost like like really simple things uh yeah maybe i'll try totally. doing those this weekend maybe honestly maybe getting i i get like those sa those salad bags and they just come with a ton of greens and vegetables and carrots and cabbage and uh seeds and stuff like that and as well i usually throw out the dressing that they come with because it isn't very good <laughs> um so i'll throw that stuff away but then i'll put that into a wok and i'll saute it up and that is a fantastic thing to be able to have stuff <laughs> too much work I your air fryer in that sentence <laughs> <laughs> so oh get out of here with your air fryer it's not, superiority it's not, <laughs> not superiority it's just <laughs> That's it's hard. just superior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that I, I, I like that it makes it really easy. So then I don't have to chop up all the vegetables. Some of them are already chopped up. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a ton of great things and in, in cooking with Pete, I think is going to cover all of it when we, when we get this going. So, is that ever going to happen? Uh, it's going to happen. So okay. it's going to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think that this is a common question. A lot of people have about rest weeks and that sort of thing. And once again, just to double down on what Pete said, you should adhere to healthy nutritional principles of nourishment hundred percent of the time. Uh, you the shouldn't worst. turn them off, off and on, follow those throughout, and then make sure that you're giving your body the proper nourishment it needs when it's training, as well as when it's recovering. The worst case you start your next block, you're low on glycogen. You're not recovered. <laughs> this is the recipe for burnout. Uh, mm -hmm. like we, we've, we've heard other people on the podcast, uh, maybe not reds, but maybe on the, on the road to it and, uh, red S I always call it red. Anyways, th that's, that's a very, very bad situation. And you're not mm -hmm. going to then get, uh, the fitness that you want from that. And you'll probably end up actually not being, uh, the way your performance. I mean, I just said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. That is it. <laughs> Let's go into Zach's question and then we'll get into some live questions. Yes. Zach says, first time, long time, five stars as everything I know about myself as a cyclist stems one way or another from the trainer own universe. Oh, it's good Aww. to hear Zach it says, are there any studies or strong opinions on the use of smelling salts? Like the ammonia packs that you see used by NFL players in the sport of cycling, whether for the end of a ramp test in the middle of a really hard effort or the last few laps at a crit. Anything for a little legal, I think he says in parentheses, uh, pick me up going to try one on my next ramp test. So just ignore this. If this is okay. Uh, he says, thanks. So as far as it being okay, Pete, you, you dug into this, uh, it, there's probably okay, but then there's also probably science behind this, right? Yeah. And they, they are legal. So you're welcome to, uh, rip a, or smash a, uh, ammonia <laughs> tablet anytime you want and see what happens. Um, but unfortunately it looks like they aren't going to do much. Um, Real quick, just so anybody who doesn't know what a, a smelling salt is, they're <clears throat> used, uh, they've been around for hundreds of years in various forms, which is kind of crazy. And uh, they've pretty much been used to revive people who have been passed out. Um, the reason they do that is because they arouse the consciousness, consciousness because the release of ammonia gas that accompanies their use irritates the membranes, membranes of the nose and lungs and thereby triggers an in, inhalation reflex. This reflex alters the pattern of breathing, resulting in improved respiratory flow rates and possibly, in quotations, alertness. Um, so they've kind of they've fallen out of favor with medical professionals. Um, I wonder why, uh, <laughs> but they still seem to be used in uh, some sporting. Uh, I, I read a pretty good article on the NHL and because they're still really popular in the, in the NHL and at least as of a few years ago and baseball and things like that. And kind of, um, the science says in multiple studies that they do not increase like one rep max deadlifts and one rep max, um, like glute extensions, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, the hockey players seem to have seemed to say that they increase alertness and they feel pretty good for their really short stints, um, out on the ice, uh, which is like 30 seconds or 40 seconds in some cases. Um, but to me, it looks like there is a uh, kind of a placebo effect with kind of really uh, doing aggressive 
<laughs> smells that smell bad and make your eyes water and make you uh, make your breathing change and then jumping out there and doing it. Um, it doesn't seem possible to me based on the science that it could do anything other than irritate your uh, like your breathing and your eyes and then see what happens. But I probably wouldn't do them in the last one lap of a Kurt race personally. Um, but we could find out, right? Uh, every, everybody gets what they want. Uh, seems like the NHL players still use them. So I think the placebo is pretty strong. I don't know. My breathing feels pretty irritated by the end of a Kurt. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Here's some more irritant for you, right? <laughs> But the, the, like the logic that I see a lot of the time communicate, even in movies, like this is super common, like somebody having somebody smell something that kind of like arouse them, bring them back to, to a state of consciousness. But you know, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's going to work. Sadly, Nate, did you have something you were going to add to this? Uh, placebo for sure. I mean, you'd be <laughs> like, Hey, you got to do this superpower, get out there, do it. Uh, that is yeah. placebo is huge, right? If you think mm -hmm. you're more alert and that this thing's going to give you an extra edge, especially in something like a skill base, like uh, baseball or uh, hockey where you're like, or football, I now have 10% more power in football because of this, you probably will have 10% more power in, mm -hmm. uh, in that, uh, that down. Like, Heck yeah. yeah. Tan legs, cyclists, you know, yeah. your legs look good. You're going to pedal better. You know what I mean? Like that there's tons of things that we do for cycling. Your kit looks good. So Hold you on. like it and you ride fast. Are you telling right? me that stuff doesn't work? Like, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> oh, that's the stuff for me. But that's the thing. In the end, it kind of does work, right? If it helps put you in the head space that you need to be in. So like, mm -hmm. give me 10,000 placebos. If it makes me improve my performance, I'll take them all, right? That's that's the thing. You just, it's when you get it conflated with bit like scientific backing behind like mechanism and extrapolating a mechanism out to performance, that's when things get problematic because then you can really chase something down a, a dead end street. But in this case, yeah, like, you know, if it feels like it's helping you, then sure. But these can be dangerous if you use them too much or inhale them too closely even. And then in addition mm -hmm. to that, if you're going to do this on a ramp test, then you probably would want to have that same sort of stimulation on every workout. So like, I would not want to do this. Uh, this would, and also just thinking of trying to do anything else beside survive that last minute of a ramp test. I can't, I can't even think about functioning in any other way. It's like everything that you have. <laughs> so yeah, it'd be pretty rough, but, uh, it's interesting though. Now, like this is movie myths debunked. I've wondered about that one forever. So we have a few minutes to address some live questions that people have asked. Uh, so I will go through those ones and then uh, we can answer some of those. If you have any that you want to submit and you're in the live chat right now, you can do that. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, this first one, um, upcoming races at so the trainer road crew, will you be at any upcoming races and do you have any on the calendar? Nate, do you have any? I, uh, uh I, that's a tough thing. I want to, <laughs> and they're starting to come up and there's like a gravel race locally. And then there's a, I was so excited for a tour of America's dairy land, but I just looked, my six week TSS is 12. So I don't know <laughs> if I, I just get dropped. What I need to do is join training a team camp. and just be like, yeah, I'll uh, uh, just get a drop <laughs> training camp, like get pulled from the, each race. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't have any, well, I have Cape Epic. Hey, how about that? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a little one. Just go cold into that one. Make that the first crack for the, of, the, of the year. Yeah. Uh, Amber, you don't have any races on your calendar. You've got a very important no. date on your calendar. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, just, I got one date on the calendar right now. That's it. That's yeah. I'm focused on. Uh, and two, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, Amber's like journey after having a kid because it is whew, kids are work. It's a journey. Like it's a <laughs> yeah. very big journey. And uh, says two I, dads I, too. Like you and I, I are nodding here as dads, and we don't even have an idea of what it's like to be a mom. You know, it's actually, <laughs> you know, it's really awesome though. Is I've already gotten some excellent, excellent advice from everybody here. So it's awesome. I feel like I have a lot of mentors here, so I'm going to be leaning on you guys. <laughs> I'll just, I, 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 I just raise my hands most of the time. When my, so, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Pete, do you have any races on your calendar? Um, the Folsom, there's a Folsom crit in a, uh, in a few weeks, two weeks or maybe Ooh. or something like that. Um, and I'm allowed to, as soon as I swap to a different brace, I'm allowed to do activities again. Um, so I'm going to try because why not? It's, it's a flat, easy crit. How could I not go? That's two hours away. <laughs> so that's going to be my tester. Um, I'm trying to come back for two of America's Dairyland too. Uh, we'll find out. Um, but I, my 
three week TSS is like 12 also, Nate. So we could, we could probably train together if you want, uh, cool. Cool get, get back into it. <laughs> I was so fit in January. Then that, like that, I did not mm-hmm. think races were going to happen so soon. And that Folsom flat crit, that is a good crit for me. That's yep. a very good yeah. crit for me. Uh, shoot. I, no I have, uh, May 29th. I have a mountain bike race locally here in Northern California in a place called Susanville. That's going to happen. And then thanks to a podcast listener. Thank you so much for this, for offering this transfer June 10th, 11th, and 12th. I think of the dates are 11th, 12th, and 13th. I'm going to be racing Tulsa tough. I cannot cool. wait. It'll be in the one, two category. I am not in the pro category. So that's um, tough. The one, two there. Ooh. Oh yeah. It'll be, it'll be fast. I'm looking forward to it. So it's going to be a blast. I think Pete, you're going to be there, but not race it. Is that correct? I, I think that's the plan. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll be there cheering you on and saying hi to everybody. Oh, sorry, Pete. It'd be awesome. Right. So, and keep in mind here, I can have three days of racing. So that's three chances for me to royally screw up and have learnings for race analysis. So <laughs> it's going to be great. Uh, we'll have plenty of that. So it'll be the first one I think in a long time. I want to see you on that third day because that has the very steep hill. And I, yep. in my mind, a very steep, punchy hill is very much like mountain biking. That's your thing. And yeah. as the group whittles down and then you've got a good sprint when you're tired. So that would be interesting, but also the one, two at Tulsa tough. I mean, Pete, you've done that, right? It is, that is national level caliber. It's really good with teams and all that. Uh, I, I actually don't know. I've, I've there's a P one and a one, two. And so I'm, I've seen the one, two race. It looks very fast. It seems like a lot of people have a hard time deciding between joining the P one or a lot of the cat ones have a hard time deciding whether to join the P one or race the one, two, um, some really fast people have won the one, two races. Like I think, um, I don't know, you would recognize the names of people who have won the one, two race. So it'll be, there'll be some learnings, I think for John. So you've raced yes. the P one Pete. Yeah. And how fast was yeah. that? It was, it's the hardest race. Uh, it's definitely the hardest group of crit races I've ever done. Um, even when I was firing on all cylinders, racing the best I've ever raced, I wasn't racing for even a top 20. I was racing for like 25th or 30th, which is, was hard to wrap my head around. Uh, and I bet that goes down in categories, right? It's not just like mm-hmm. just the P1. Just P1. Amber, yeah. did you ever do it? That's one I never no. got to. Yeah. I'm excited. This is like a bucket list event for me. So I'm really looking forward to that. I can't wait to do it. And then national it's championships, like a party, which, right? Yeah. Sorry, party. Oh yeah. Three days I, of party, I'm different coming. courses all throughout. When is it? Yeah. Nate, yeah. Nate, you should come. It's a blast. Let's it's do the most uh, fun beers with Nate. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Right. <laughs> Go John. <Yeah>. Woo. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, and then, uh, national championships, which moved up a week. It's, uh, basically 4th of July week in Colorado. So, um, that those are the things on the calendar. I'm super excited for it. Uh, Chris Henderson, he asks about crank arm length and he says that he just switched to 165s from 170s and he's wondering why his power is different. Chris, we have a whole episode. If you search, ask a cycling coach podcast on crank length, not a whole episode, but a whole thing where Chad went really deep on crank length. So you can listen to that. Yes. It should feel different. Yes. Your body can adapt. And yes, there's probably a better crank length for you, but it's not something that's going to be truly limiting you. If not for just a short period of time. Uh, okay. And let's just do one more question from, yeah, let's do Zusha. Okay. How would you recommend structuring workouts between crits, especially while in school full-time? What should I focus on? So this sounds like you probably don't have like an a race, but you just have regular, uh, like reoccurring races. What would you say to that Amber, um, with additional stress that they have of like school and all that stuff? Yeah. So you definitely want to take into account whole life stress. Um, but I've done this myself and I think a few of us have, so we can all share what we've done, but what I used to do was I'd take Monday off. Cause that was usually the day after the last race on the weekend. So that was my recovery day. And then I'd have three days of work, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, or Tuesday, two days of work, Tuesday, Wednesday, then Thursday, I would take off, which would be two days before my race. And then Friday I would do openers and then Saturday, Sunday race. Um, so lots of recovery built into that, but also when you're racing every weekend, that's a lot of intensity. So you have to take that into account. And when you're in a, when you're a student, there's a lot, there's a lot of stress going on off the bike as well that you need to account for. So, um, Mm. if you're just racing crits too, and not just, but if you're racing only crits, you don't have to do a ton of volume either. So that's kind of a nice thing is you can focus more on quality over quantity in terms of, um, in terms of the training you are doing. What would you say, Pete? It's you. 
Yeah, this is me. I did this for a long time. Um, I would have one quality workout a week that I needed to be productive. Usually it was on Tuesdays. Um, and sometimes I'd push it to Wednesdays if I couldn't actually do the workout. Uh, sometimes that's a local Tuesday night group ride. Um, a lot of the times I would sacrifice the group ride and do a workout instead because the workout was it's the most important thing I would do all week. Um, and it was usually a really hard 90 minute workout that was more representative of the races that I was looking towards later in the season. Um, and then I would usually do two easy rides, um, like very easy, uh, one hour spins. And I would usually try to do sprints on Thursdays just to stay, not lose the, you know, the real top, top end. Um, and then depending on the race, if it was an easy race, I wouldn't do openers. And if it was a hard race, I would. Um, and that's always how I treated it because it felt like if I raced both on Saturday and Sunday, the openers did take a little bit out of me and I could tell at the second half of the race on Sunday. So rather than use too much, I would go fresher or it would be rough for the first 20 minutes of Saturday's race. Um, but if it's an easy race, you're not going to get dropped or anything, but if it's a super hilly climby, I would do the openers and sacrifice the second half of my Sunday race. Hmm. Nate, do you have anything to add to that one? Uh, I like both their ideas, but I would just do the, uh, trainer training plan and then cut out the weekend days and then do the, the weekdays. Cause it, it kind of lines up with that and openers have never really, I like taking a rest day before and get some extra glycogen in than uh, doing openers. And I found that's worked well. Uh, Tulsa tough. I have my kids that weekend, so I don't, I can't go unless we change schedules and, but it's got a grand fondo on Saturday and Sunday. You know how great that mm -hmm. would be for me to do that in the morning and then watch you guys race in the afternoon. That sounds super fun. Uh, yeah, next Sarah, time. Sarah might come with Simon. She could, we, we, we could have the kids with us too. It could be good fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would party so. then. So <laughs> <laughs> a different Sarah really fun. wants to watch them the whole time. <laughs> but we shouldn't do that though. I'm just joking. No, not at all. Um, so anyways, it, it, it's been a blast to have the crew back here with us, a ton of fun. And, uh, if you have questions, once again, submit them at trainerroadcom slash podcast. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. If you're joining us now, give us a thumbs up on YouTube. That will make other people find it. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can hit a notification bell. So then every time a Maxine and Piper are putting out these awesome videos, you can see them and get notified of when they get posted. Uh, cause they do that regularly. Check out the trainer road blog, check out the new plan, sign up for the adaptive training beta and go to the forum, all the trainer road things go do all that stuff and we will talk to you all next week thanks everybody bye everyone bye guys bye, -bye.